to bring this meeting to order. Today is Wednesday, June 7th. We're from Virginia Beach, Mid Atlantic Fishery Management Council. Um, before I turn things over to Wes to say a few things, I just want to thank the council for its flexibility. I wasn't able to participate yesterday. Um, my firstborn uh, graduated from high school last night, so it was a big, uh, big event at the house. Lots of family, lots of friends, and people around. So um, I was up like Sonny and and Wes, and probably Skip most of the time uh, earlier than I normally get up in the morning, but I. I pulled in just in time, so to get things kicked off today. Um, so thanks for that flexibility. But before we start with our first item on today's agenda, I'm going to turn things over to Wes, uh, Vice Chair, to say a few words. Wes. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Skip, I want to thank you for last night. I think everybody had an absolute great time. You did great on the weather compared to this morning so far. Uh, food was great. The, your staff was great. and. Uh, I think we all had a great time. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And uh, Shelly arranged the weather for us and the food, so we got to thank her also. All right, thank you. And we've had so many dolphins in the Chesapeake Bay up our way, even in around Annapolis, that uh, if something goes doesn't go well for you out here, Skip. I think you got another calling. You can move move yourself up to Maryland and do just fine. People are talking about right now getting out of the charter boat business and just taking people out to look for dolphins. Uh, there's so many of them up there. It's amazing. Um, okay, so turning to our first item on today's agenda, we're going to go uh, to Jessica, who's going to present the 20... My glasses on yet, hold on. 2024 Atlantic Surf Clam and Ocean Quahog Specification. So Jessica Coakley with council staff is going to provide us the presentation. Whenever you're ready, Jess. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So for today's review um, of 2024 measures, I'm going to do an overview, a quick overview of the Surf Clam Fishery Information Doc. Um, I'll note that this year we received a fishery data update from the Northeast Fishery Science Center, Dr. Dan Hennen. Um, no survey data was available um, for inclusion um, in the document, although the survey did go out, it just wasn't fully entered and analyzed by the time we were preparing these documents. But we expect to have um, survey information next year as well for you. Um, just a reminder that you received a level three um, surf clam management track assessment and a level one ocean quahog management track assessment back in 2020. And the surf clam is scheduled for another management track assessment in 2024. Then I'm going to cover the fishery performance report. Um, this includes uh, both species in a combined document. I'll present the staff recommendations for surf clam. I'll present the, um, if Dr. Rago is online, he can present the SSC recommendations for surf clam. And then we'll do a repeat of all of that for ocean cohogs. So for surf clam, based on that management track assessment, the biomass is above the target level. So surf clam is not overfished. And based on that um, assessment with data through 2019, uh, overfishing was not occurring in the surf clam fishery. This is a um, landings information. I know many of you are aware there was an update um, and a transition to a CAMS landings data system. So this provides um, the most recent landings information um, and shows you the historic time series and how the previous landings that CF DERS, um, which was the prior system and the um, CAMS landings compare to one another. Okay. Uh, this provides um, information on landings by region. So starting in the south um, with that purple color, Southern Virginia, Delmarva, New Jersey, Teal Blue, Long Island is green, Southern New England yellow, Georgia's bank, and black. Um, you'll see in recent years, um, there's a little bit of purple in 2019, 2021, and 2022 landings. Um, and that's an uptick in surf clam landings that were occurring off offshore um, and being landed in um, Virginia. 
Uh, but the bulk of the landings um, in the fishery, as you can see, are coming from uh, New Jersey and um, Long Island, southern New England area. This is the landings per unit effort, also by areas. Um, the total um, uh, LPUE for the uh, entire year across all regions is that solid black line. And then you can see the LPUE for each of the individual regions. Um, and the way this fishery operates, they sort of go into an area. So purple, for example, you see Georgia's Bank. After Georgia's Bank opened, you see the LPUEs are um, quite high. And then you see that decline in LPU, LPU over time as those more, um, as those uh, circlam beds with the higher catch rates are fished down. In 2022, there were 33 vessels that participated in the surf clam fishery. So those were vessels that landed either surf clam or surf clam and ocean quahog. Um, that's eight less than in 2021. There were eight processor dealers um, that reported landing um, either surf clam or ocean quahog in five states in 2022. Um, there was also an increase in overall ex vessel value it was $28 million in 2022. That was up 4 million from 2021. Um, but obviously 2020 and 2021, there were some declines due to uh, COVID um, effects in the marketplace. So taking a look at current year landings. So these are landings through May, um, May 24. So data through that date. Um, the Blue line is the uh, 2023 landings. Um, the yellow line is the 2022 landings. So you can see the landings thus far this year are pretty much on par with what was landed the prior year. That green line on the graph is the quota rationing trajectory. So if the quota was taken at an exactly even rate throughout the fishing year, um, that uh, you know the landings would lay on top of that line. Um, so the fishery has been landing um, substantially less than the quota um, in the last two years. Now I'm gonna to touch on the fishery performance report. It covers both surf clams and ocean quahogs. Um, the advisors met on April 13th to provide information and updates to the report. They were asked a series of trigger questions that we ask all of our advisors and our advisory panel um, members. And I just want to note that, um, you know, the document has a lot of different perspectives in it, and it represents a lot of different viewpoints from our advisors. And they're going to be talking a little bit about some of their perspectives on the important issues they've identified in the performance report following this, um, this uh, specs discussion. So the advisors identified several critical issues in that document. I'm going to highlight those, but there's a lot more detail in there that, um, that you can read through. Um, I'll also note that in their report, the advisors again indicated they'd like to see status quo quotas for the upcoming fishing year 2024 because that quota stability translates into fishery market stability. So one of their, their comments in the report was that they have raised a number of issues in past fishery performance reports to the council um, and the SSC, um, and, and many of those items were raised for council action. Um, many of these requests they feel have not been taken up, so they're concerned about the re relevance of the performance report to the council, um, and they wanted to request an update from the council on how their requests are being followed up on or how those are or are not being taken up. Another issue, um, and this will be touched on in the next presentation, um, they have concerns about um, the rate at which the regulations for shellfish safety are being updated by the Food and Drug Administration and NOAA Seafood Inspection. Um, they feel that NOAA fisheries, um, the FDA updated these model ordinance regulations related to shellfish um, safety back in 2019. They felt that NOAA fisheries has not addressed these changes, um, in particular on George's Bank, the paralytic shellfish poisoning area. Um, and these updates to the regulations also include um, considerations related to shellfish biotoxin protocols. Um, so they feel that these um, areas staying closed are preventing fishery access. Um, so they'd like to request the council hold a meeting with NOAA fisheries leadership 
um, the regional administrator, others, and appropriate public health safety groups and its advisors to discuss prioritizing implementing any changes related to um, those 2019 regulations. Another issue um, that's critical to this group is the co-occurrence of surf clam and ocean quahog. Um, they feel that's a, a continuing issue of concern for the fisheries. Um, the AP noted that they are working um, uh, to try to identify approaches that address accountability, you know, both monitoring and enforcement um, while the council is working on its species separation requirements amendment. In addition, they highlighted um, th that it was very important for the council to support research in the Great South Channel Habitat Management Area. This is that um, Nantucket Shoal, Southern New England area. Um, it's a surf clam only, only fishing area. Um, they felt that the lack of access has really been a challenge for the industry. Um, and the advisors would like to see the council prioritize this issue. And the council also generally, you know, it wouldn't be uh, a meeting if we didn't mention wind. So the development of wind energy and aquaculture um, continue to be um, a concern and other sort of offshore ocean uses and how those interact with our, our fisheries have really become a, a critical issue for this, um, this fishing industry. And last important issue they noted in the document, they felt that the advisory panel um, They'd like to request that the fishery management action teams, when they work on any surf clam or ocean quahog related actions, be convened jointly with the advisory panel for any issues related to those fisheries. So uh, you have the full fishery performance report um, in your briefing book materials. I'm going to shift gears to the SSC um, and um, previous council recommendations. So. Specs have been set for um, surf clams and ocean quahogs as well for 2021 to 2026. Um, back when recommendations were made for surf clams by the SSC, they recommended a modified OFL probability distribution with a coefficient of variation of 100% that was based on that previous management track assessment. And that resulted in a 2024 P-star of 0.46 um, for this fishery. The um, flow of catch limit recommendations for this fishery um, is as it appears in this figure. We start with that overfishing limit. The SSC develops their recommendation, um, considering scientific uncertainty to recommend the acceptable biological catch. The FMP prescribed that the ACL be set equal to the ABC. And then the council um, considers setting a um, annual catch target based on management uncertainty. So based on that flow chart and the recommendations from the SSC and other input that you had back in 2020, these are the SSC and council recommendations for um, ACLs, ACTs, uh, and commercial quotas in the fishery. As you can see over time, they've remained relatively um, stable. Um, so the 2024 row there is what you have currently recommended. So the staff reviewed all of this information and they recommended no changes to measures for 2024. I'll note that the council would need a motion to recommend the regional administrator suspend the minimum size. That's an annual requirement to keep current 2024 measures in place exactly as they are. I'll note that last year um, you made that recommendation. Um, Garfo determined that the proportion of surf clams in the fishery smaller than 4.75 inches last year did not exceed that 30% trigger. Um, however, I'll note based on that reporting information from August 2021 to July 2022, um, the number came very close to 30%. So it was 27.6% of the landings um, were under that 4.75 minimum size with the lower confidence limit and the upper com confidence limit given um, as 25.4 and 29.8%, so very close. So um, if you make a recommendation to suspend the minimum size, then GARFO would conduct another analysis prior to rulemaking to take a look at the information they have available 
for August 2022 through July 2023 to make a determination if they can, in fact, suspend the minimum size. Um, this is the recommendation slide for the SSC. Is uh, Dr. Rago, are you online? Uh, yes, I am. Great, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Um, yeah, the SSC reviewed uh, the information that Jessica just presented as well as information provided by the center. Um, so, um, and after that review, they we concluded that, uh, you know, of course, the, the stock itself remains above target levels and fishing mortality is well below the target values um, and thresholds. So um, despite some warning signs and some in the stock trends, the SSC concluded that no changes were necessary from the previously approved ABC of 40,946 metric tons. Now, the warning signs include a number of factors, um, the first of which is that the long-term trends and landings per unit effort reflect uh, the, the fleet shifting among various areas over time, as Jessica described. Um, those changes are primarily due to economic reasons and not necessarily related to total stock status. However, uh, there is a limit to that, um, that shifting that occurs. And so um, that, that does uh, uh, have, some, have some longer term implications. Um, the fraction of undersized uh, clams in the landings has been increasing and it um, is just below the 30% uh, limit as, uh, as described in the plan. Um, this may be a, a, a historical artifact in the sense that uh, it, it's probably relevant to, to review the, the um, utility of this, at least in terms of uh, its uh, long-term uh, implications for stock dynamics. Uh, so that would just be a, a, a topic that could be taken up at the future research track. Um, again, in a similar vein, the, the mixed catches with ocean quahog remain a concern uh, for both fisheries. These are um, largely related <clears throat> to, to enforcement issues, not necessarily stock condition or exploitation rates. Uh, and finally, we noted that um, uh, the, the higher temperatures are, are reducing growth rates in the southern part of the range. This has been known for, for a long time. Um, however, it, it, uh, as it progresses, it will have longer term implications for the productivity of the resource. So um, that's all the, uh, I have to say on this and uh, I'll turn it back to you, Jessica. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, and Mr. Chair, that's all I have for surf clam. If you'd like to take a pause for questions or I can continue with Quahog, it's, it's up to you. Yeah, thanks, Jess, and thanks, Dr. Rago. Let's go ahead and uh, take a pause, a quick pause for questions, if anyone has them before we move on. Is there anyone in the room? Adam Nowalski. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So two items here caught my attention that could appreciate some input on. First off was slide number six that showed the distribution of catch uh, with what appears to be in recent years a significant contracting of the harvest levels occurring uh, off Georgia's bank. Uh, as well as some indicator, yep, that's the one, as well as, as you indicated, that purple from Southern Virginia. And the AP performance rights report specifically noted Cape Charles as a revived port of landings. What are we seeing here? Is this purely something driven by economics? Is this potentially a reversal in some of the trends that we've been seeing historically? Um, what information can you provide, or perhaps we can get any information from anyone in the audience, Mr. Chairman, that helps explain what we're seeing here? Yeah, I'll ask Jessica maybe if that's something that's come up, um, maybe to help Adam understand what he's seeing before we go to the audience, Jessica. Sure. Um, there, there was a set a few years back off of Virginia of surf clams and um, those landings that you see in that southern Virginia area on the chart now are, are you know, they're old enough that they're fishing on those. Um, th those clams um, in those southern areas is uh, it was noted that they grow slower 
at um, those higher temperatures. So those clams may not reach a really, really large size. So that may be partly um, part of the sort of influx of smaller clams into the, the fishery, into those percentages that we're seeing um, may be um, part of that. Um, I know I've talked to Dr. Hennen a, a little bit about this, and um, it's not clear if we would continue to get sets there, you know, that you know they're going to be able to continue to fish on, or if the temperatures are going to get warm enough that when the clams reach a certain size, they don't survive very well in those really high temperatures. So what, it's not real clear yet um, how that's going to play out. I, again, if, I don't know if there's anyone else in the audience here today that would like to comment. Uh, again, the, the, I see a contracting Georges Bank fishery here. I see availability in a southern region, which seems to reverse a lot of what we've seen in the last decade. And I'm left wondering what exactly the explanation is for that. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Um, I'll look to the audience to see if there's anyone that may have some thoughts here. Tom? Good morning. So Surfside Foods discovered some large beds of clams down off of Virginia a few years ago. Um, and we also did some research into why some previous sets may not have made it to legal size down off of Virginia. And when we when we looked at some of the bottom water temperature models, it seems like in previous years, there was actually some offshoots of some warm water that came in off of the Gulf Stream and hung out for a month, and which surf clams could typically survive. Um, but it was followed up by another warm set of, of, of an, you know, just an offshoot of warm water that ended up sitting there and um, when, the, when the temperature gets so high, the surf clams basically just stop feeding. So there, was, there, was several, there were several sets down there that didn't make it to marketable size and were never fished on. Um, about eight years ago, some of the survey data showed that there was some more large sets down off of Virginia. And one of our cap captains kept an eye on that and went down there every once in a while. And um, the, the catch rates were up to 14 times what we were experiencing off of, uh, off of New Jersey. We did some analysis of um, size classes and <clears throat> the, dredge only, the dredge will only pick up, you know, marketable size and, and, a, and a bit lower. But we, we showed that there were five-year-old clams, six-year-old clams, seven-year-old clams, eight-year-old clams in in the in the uh, product that we were bringing back to, to our plant. So as long as um, as long as that Gulf Stream doesn't keep keep messing us up, we we could have a uh, we could have the reemergence of a decent fishery down there. Yeah, Tom. So Adam's question, I guess, was in two parts as well. So was there a shift in effort from what's being um, viewed here as a decrease from Georgia's bank into the southern region? Or so, is it, was it, that's, I guess it's understood that there was a set and uh, clams were found and, and fishermen had access to that, so they went and took them. But was there a shift in effort or was this an anomaly that we don't expect to continue to occur as far as what Adam's question was? Was it a, was it a different, not a range expansion, but a movement of the stock right. to the south? Right, so um, <clears throat> was a, a reemergence of the stock, not necessarily a, a movement. Our, our captains found that you know, the, the good sets were actually in areas where they had good sets 20, 25 years ago. As far as it being a shift from Georgia's banks, it it's just so happened that Georgia's banks was decreasing and and Sea Watch, um, 
Sea Watch is the company that, that was working off Georgia's banks, and Surfside Foods being a totally different company, it just happened to happen at the same time where we discovered these large beds down off of Virginia as, as the beds off of Georgia's banks became less productive. Out of, I, I appreciate that input and <laughs> my experience in time on the water has told me that what we perceive as human beings just so happened Mother Nature usually has an answer for why it's happening. We just don't understand what it is. So, you know, we had this conversation yesterday uh, with regards to unmanaged forage fish about being able to monitor things to try to stay ahead of the curve. Uh, and this is the type of thing that also catches my eye is something I think we should be keeping a close eye on. I'm sure the industry itself is, um, but it just catches my attention as something we should be on the leading edge of not be sitting here five or ten years from now saying, oh, wow, we should have seen that transition occurring. All right, thanks, Adam. Really one, good. One, uh, go ahead, Tom. One, one, one quick point. So, um, Boehm spent a significant amount of money, I think $550,000 with a project for Rutgers looking at the overlap of the um, wind energy areas with the surf clam fishery, especially off of Atlantic City, because we have a very high overlap. And Atlantic Shores stepped in with another project that was a, about the same amount of money, $550,000. And they used their, um, uh, they used future, future cast modeling for bottom water temperatures to show exactly the models, they, they modeled where the surf clam fishery is likely going to be over the next 30, 30 some years according, according to those models. So that, that might be very interesting uh, work for you guys to see. And one thing, about, one thing about surf clams and ocean cohogs is when they spawn, that, that spawn expands to areas way beyond where they can that where they, the actual decent habitat is. So as the habitat moves, the species has the ability to move with it just because they put spawn out in such a big area, even though that it's a, it's a small area within that, that they'll actually settle and survive. All right, thanks, Tom. Appreciate thanks, that insight. Any other questions from anyone in the room regarding the presentation given by Jessica? Is there anyone online? Member of the council online, who I know we have a few uh, today. I don't see any hands raised at this point. Um, Jessica, was were you planning to go into uh, cohogs at this point, or did you want to take up motions or anything on surf clams now you want to wait till we'll wait till the end okay go ahead when you're, whenever you're ready okay so um for ocean cohog um in the fishery performance document you'll see this figure um it shows the cohog biomass um is just above the target level so ocean cohog based on data through 2019 was not overfished um and overfishing was not occurring in this fishery um, because it's below the threshold level. Um, a similar figure for cohog that we showed for surf clams that shows the prior landings information under the CF DERS system and the new CAMS monitoring um, information. Um, the, the new data lay on top of one another a little bit better in this fishery than they did for um, surf clams and um, surf clams. Um, and then the dotted line, um, you can also see the quota level in this fishery. So for quahog, again, landings um, through 2022 by area, Southern Virginia, all the way up to Georgia's bank. Most of the landings in recent years in this fishery have come from that Long Island, Southern New England, and Georgia's bank. Oh,
Quahog landings per unit effort um, is also provided in the document. Again, the same areas with that black um, line, black solid line showing the average landings per unit effort across all areas over time. Um, and we have a much flatter landings per unit effort um, pattern in this fishery, although you do see some of the same sort of regional patterns um, in some areas. So for Ocean Quahog in 2022, there were 12 non-main vessels that participated in that fishery. Uh, the main fishery, which is the main mahogany Quahog fishery that in past years has been allocated 100,000 bushels to that fishery, they landed 12,711 bushels in 2022. Again, eight processor dealers um, reported landings of both species in five states. And for Ocean Quahog, we saw an increase in the overall ex vessel value. It was up $3 million to $21 million in 2022. This figure gives you the Quahog landings. Um, this is non-main, so it includes the main, excludes the main mahogany Quahog fishery landings with data through May 24th. Um, the 2023 Quahog landings are a little bit higher than what we saw in 2022, um, but they are also much lower than the overall quota. Um, as you can see, those lines are well below that quota rationing trajectory um, for the fishing year. So the SSC recommendations for 2021 through 2026, those Quahog measures that are in place relied on an Mo SSC modified OFL probability distribution with a CV of 100%. That was all based on that level one management track assessment and resulted in a P star for 2024 of 0.49. The flow chart um, for Ocean Quahog is just a little different than surf clams. Um, once we get to the setting of the annual catch limit, um, the council sets an annual catch target for the non main fishery. Um, and then the, um, the council has allocated 100,000 bushels as an annual catch target to the main mahogany quahog fishery. These are all the recommendations, both from the SSC and the council for 2021 to 2026. Um, the commercial quota that you've recommended each year has remained um, steady the same over those last um, few years. So the staff reviewed all this information and we recommend no changes to measures for the 2024 fishing year. And I'll let Dr. Rago cover the um, SSC recommendations for Ocean Quahog. Okay, this will be my shortest presentation in history. The stock biomass is high, fishing mortality is low. There are no trends in any of the indicators and that the SSC recommended no changes uh, from the previously approved ABC of 44,065 metric tons in 2024. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. Um, I just have uh, two more slides. So I did wanna highlight you um, just briefly on the CLAM survey. So 2022, um, it was great, it happened. So we were really excited about that. As I noted, the data wasn't entered or processed in time um, for these meetings, but we'll have that information available next year. Also good news, 2023 um, is supposed to happen. So we should have another set of survey information um, for surf clams. Um, for this 2023 survey, um, both myself and Dr. Hennen um, received uh, project funding um, to deploy electronic electronic monitoring um, on that survey vessel. So it's going to deploy image, an image collection system, looking down on the conveyor belt for the surf clams and quahogs, collect all that imagery that's gonna be tagged, that's gonna be processed. They're gonna develop um, machine learning AI capabilities to automate the identification of those individual species, including measuring surf clams and quahogs using that technology. Um, so that's um, going to start here shortly, and that's um, that's very exciting to get that going. Um, also, uh, about a year and a half ago, we received a presentation um, from Matt Hare at Cornell University. He was conducting um, genetics work on surf clams, looking at that southern surf clam, similis, and then identifying two um, haplotypes 
which we were calling sort of inshore solidissima and offshore solidissima. Um, but because of COVID, um, we were not able to obtain all of the uh, samples we wanted to cover the geographic range in federal waters. So um, we have a supplement um, that's going with Dr. Hare. They've received samples from the Science Center that they collected on that 2022 survey. Um, so they're going to be processing, doing all the genetic processing on that information. And they're going to rerun those gene flow models as well. Um, so those will be represented based on this information. So we expect to have all of that available in early 2024. Um, and that completes my, my presentation, Mr. Chair. Okay, thanks, Jessica. Does anyone have any questions on cohogs for Jessica? Anyone online? Seeing no questions at this time, um, I'll ask whether or not any member of the council would like to make a motion regarding specifications for surf clam and ocean quahog. Peter Hughes. Morning, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, I do have a motion. I'm just waiting for it to get scrolled up on the board, and then I can enter that into the record. Yeah, look for a second. Okay. Move to request that the regional administrator suspend the Atlantic surf clam minimum size for 2024. As a motion. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Peter. I'll call for a second for that. Skip Feller seconds that motion. Did you want to speak to the motion at all, Peter? I think Jessica went into the details pretty well, but it's something that we do on an annual basis. Um, so this is just following, I believe it started. Um, what we came up with, so it's 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 an annual um, motion that needs to be made. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Peter. Skip. We're good. Okay, and just just to be clear, um, because no other changes were recommended, specifications will continue. Uh, can you remind me when the current spe specifications will need to be revisited? Um, I, I'm just blanking on the time period that we have them set for. Sure, we have measures set for both surf clam and ocean quahog through 20 fishing year 2026. Um, we do expect in 2024 to receive a management track assessment for surf clams. Um, so I'm not sure. I mean, I think that should be available um, for the council to consider if they want to make modifications to the 2025 fishing year. Um, so when we get that available and we get the timing synced up, we can um, make any changes. But it's it's good you have all of those on the the books through 2026. Okay, thanks for that reminder. <clears throat> any discussion on the motion? Is there anyone online? You can raise your hand. I'll call on you. Is there anyone from the audience that would like to make any comments regarding the motion? Okay, seeing none at this time, is there any objection to the motion? Seeing no objections, uh, the motion carries with one abstention by the National Marine Fisheries Service. Okay, thank you. Um, Jessica, is there anything else that needs to come before the council at this time? Uh, not on this item. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're a little bit ahead of schedule at this point, but we're going to go ahead and take up our next item on this morning's agenda. Uh, we have Atlantic Surf Clam and Ocean Quahog Advisory Panel presentation. We have three presenters. Um, my notes indicate that we uh, will get presentations from Sam Martin, Tom Dameron, and Joe Myers. And I will, I know Tom's here and, um, and Joe are here. Do you guys, is there an order that you have discussed 
as far as who's going to go first, second, and third. Sam, are you with us online? Sam, he's got his hand up. Let's see what he's got to say. Yeah, I'm online. Okay. And I can go first. I can't okay. see those guys, and I apologize for not being in person. Yeah, no trouble, Sam. Uh, we're glad to have you, and we'll look forward to your presentation. Just let us know when you're through with your part, and I'll turn to um, the others in the crowd here to, to jump in. But whenever you're ready, Sam. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, dear council members, my name is uh, Sam Martin. I'm Chief Operating Officer for Galilean Seafood and Atlantic Harvesters, and speaking on behalf of all vessel operators and processors that have built their business in and around Nantucket Shoals. I appreciate the time to inform the council on one of the critical issues that has been raised in the fishery performance reports over the last few years. Specifically, we are requesting the Mid-Atlantic Council to initiate an action to develop an access program for clam vessels in the Great South Channel HMA around the areas known as Davis Bank and Rosen Crown. The problem is Nantucket Shoal surf clam fishery produces uh, a uniquely large surf clam that is essential for our specialized hand shucking process. This process does not rely on machines. It relies on skilled, steady employees for this labor intensive work. Hand shuck clams service a premium market for clam strips and chopped meat for fresh chowders around the country. Since the closure of the HMA, we have seen more than a 50% reduction in catch rates of the essential large surf clams. The areas outside the HMA do not have the volumes of large surf clams needed to support our hand shucking operations. This jeopardizes the economic viability of our employees, fishing vessels, trucking companies, and shoreside plants located in New England, which are dependent on the hand shuck product. As a result of the closure, the surf clam fishery is not currently achieving optimum yield. The surf clams on and around Nantucket Shoals are what created this once successful business model. The areas of Davis Bank and Rosen Crown are sustainable fishing grounds for surf clams. Surf clam habitat is sandy bottom, not mud, rock, or cobble. During the development of OHA2, the New England Council was not aware of the importance of the shoals to the surf clam fishery because it does not manage the fishery and lacks the expertise and understanding of the fishery's dynamics. When the New England Council chose an area for protection, it acted on the advice from its scallop and groundfish fisheries and was not properly informed of the impacts on the clam fishery. Due to the lack of input from the clam fishery, the New England Council granted a one year exemption to conduct science to examine the impacts of hydraulic dredging in the closure. The National Science Foundation and the industry funded Science Center for Marine Fisheries conducted a robust study of the gear impacts in this area. The study showed that clam vessels do not adversely affect and impact this type of habitat because the natural forces of tidal and wave impacts far outweigh any impacts from the gear. The shoals are highly dynamic areas with significant natural fluctuations in fora and fauna. The New England Council then passed a trailing clam dredge framework published in June 18, 2019 and identified three areas for the clam industry to work in. McBlair and fishing rips are areas that can be fished year round. Old South can be fished from May 1st, October 31st each year. Old South is closed in the winter, quote unquote, to avoid disturbing spawning aggregations of cod that may occur in the area. The council chose these areas as quote unquote, they appear to be less vulnerable to habitat impacts than other areas. Unfortunately, the areas identified in the framework are not viable to sustain the hand chuck clam industry on the shoals. Fishing rip has a viable resource, but it cannot be fished due to large boulders or structure in the area. Once again, because the New England Council lacks the subject matter expertise this, that the surf clam fishery has, it chose an ineffective solution. In response to the trailing action, the industry proposed an EFP to National Marine Fishery Service to prove that the council should have chose Rosen Crown or Davis Bank over fishing rip, but National Marine Fisheries denied the request. National Marine Fisheries did approve an EFP to ascertain if the industry could fish Rosen Crown without adversely affecting and impacting habitat. 
The initial findings supported the hypothesis that the surf clam fishery could fish areas within the HMA without adverse effects to habitat. National Marine Fisheries denied the second phase of that EFP and has so far refused to consider allowing more research in the area. We made a request for the leadership of both councils to meet and discuss as to what can be accomplished through compromise. That meeting took place, with it, but with no answers or pathways established to continue working to save us. We're simply running out of time to sustain our business. We have fished and explored other areas outside the shoals that are in reasonable proximity to our plant since the closure. They do not have the CPUE or concentrations of clams we need for our hand chuck markets. Unfortunately, despite all our efforts, we have failed to prevent significant direct economic losses to our vessels, shoreside plants and employees causing significant community impacts. We have presented numerous ideas to the New England Fisheries Management Council to access areas under conservation equivalency, rotational management, and continued research. This is not a matter of sustaining a fishery resource. This is a rebuilding plan for the surf clam community and its recipients that we are asking you to engage in. To date, New England Fisheries Management Council has not prioritized or acted on any of our requests. We are asking, if not begging, the Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Management Council to prioritize an action to explore allowing access for the surf clam fishery on the Nantucket Shoals. The Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Management Council has the authority to act on this issue because it manages the surf clam fishery and all the habitat regulations for the region are under the same federal regulations. The New England Fisheries Management Council is refusing to act on the matter and when it has acted in the past, it is hindered by its lack of expertise in the fishery. The Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council is the appropriate forum for management action regarding the surf clam fishery, and it is responsible for making sure the fishery achieves its optimum yield. I don't have in mind any specific motions for the council, but if it is the will of the council to do so, please do. At the very least, our hope is that the clam committee will be tasked to address this issue soon because we're dying on the vine here in this sector of our clam industry. I appreciate the time, Mr. Chairman, for those comments. Okay, I appreciate that, Sam. Thank you very much for your thoughts. Uh, before we, what I'd like to do is go through the three presentations and then we'll open the floor for any questions or comments by members of the council. So uh, either Tom or Joe, looks like Tom's next. Come on up, Tom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so a little background on the, uh, on the NSSP guide for the control of molluscan shellfish. The Interstate Shellfish Sanitation Conference gets together every two years and they have a, they've got a, a set of guidelines that's about two and a half inches thick and that covers everything from harvesting to transportation to processing, this testing of shellfish if, if biotoxins are an issue um, each one of the states have a have a authority that attends those meetings. For example, New Jersey, it's it's the Department of Health who is the shellfish authority. Um, both the both NOAA and the FDA are part of this. Um, every two years, this meeting it's it's a huge deal. Uh, a week long. There's there's literally. There's literally hundreds of proposals to make changes to improve the safety and the sanit sanitary of our of our shellfish. Next slide. So in and this this actually started. So I was asked by the regional shellfish specialist Gary Wolf back before 2017 to 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 join the uh, the interstate shellfish sanitation conference because it it had been quite a number of years since anybody from the surf clam or ocean coag industry had actually attended any of those meetings um, so myself and some some uh, another member of surfside foods a couple members of uh, Atlantic Capes. We went ahead and became members of the of the conference. Um, kind of got our feet wet in in 2017, 
In 2018, we actually started having conversations with the executive director around some of the some of the um, issues on Georgia's banks, where Georgia's banks had had been closed for the most part since the early 90s. Um, only a only a portion of Georgia's banks was was opened, and the 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 methods of testing for PSPs and getting those claims to 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 um, the consumer was very prescriptive. There was there was no flexibility in those plans. Um, there had been thousands and thousands of of tests for for paralytic shellfish poisoning, and none of those tests had had come back positive. And it was it was obvious to the industry that there needed to be there needed to be some flexibility around this process. So we started talking to the the executive director about how we get that flexibility back in um, early 2018. And actually the outgoing executive director came up with a half dozen um, proposals to the um, proposals to, to the ISSC for edits to the to the guidelines so that there would be some flexibility. Um, the, the guidelines were really designed for, for really big boats. A high number of, of tests were, were required. If a boat went out for two or for, and these, these tests were, were quite expensive. Um, there's onboard testing that had to be done. And then when the clams got back to the shore, uh, samples had to be sent to a to a laboratory in Maine, um, where a mouse biopsy test would have to be done. So they were, you know, in cases they were killing more mice than they than they than they needed to, and um, so revisions to this were were important. And two and a half years ago, we we um, we got those we got those revisions through. Um, the ISSC with um, uh, agreement from all the states, agreement from from NOAA, FDA had the had the final signature, and and they signed off on that in uh, October 29, 2020. Next slide. So what some of these re revisions did is one they limited the the amount of time that an area could be closed for biotoxins. So if you had a if you had a biotoxin event and you closed it, it could only be closed for a limited amount of time. And and there also had to be prescriptive measures around what was needed to be done to reopen that area. So you know, much of Georgia's banks has been closed for for thirty some years. So we we were getting rid of that, right? Um, you're not going to close something for thirty years. You can close it on a short term basis, and then tell us what testing needs to be done, and what results from those testing need to be, so that that area can be reopened. Because because biotoxins come and go, and like. Like we've seen, we had a problem in 1990 in the area of Georgia's banks that that has previously been open, and thousands and thousands of tests, and we, and we haven't seen any any problem problem since. Um, in those areas of concern, it the the new model ordinance allowed for controlled access, so. A vessel and a processor could work with the state of landing, work with NOAA, work with the FDA, come up with come up with a mem memorandum of understanding so that so that everybody knew exactly what was going to be done so that we would harvest in certain areas. And one area might have that didn't have a lot of harvest might have testing protocol that was that was a lot and an area that there had been thousands of tests and no positive results 
those testings could be those testings could be could be could be ratcheted back and this would you know this would potentially save the industry a lot of money without any additional um, um, health uh, risk to to the uh, to the to the public um, the last bullet here econ the FDA and no was to consider economic considerations for what areas what areas are going to be open um, and and as everybody knows Georgia's banks has a uh, has has a um, high quantity of ocean cohorts next next slide thank you Jessica so I worked with Dan Hennon a little bit um, these numbers aren't exact but the math is pretty pretty easy the uh, the federal surveys are showing that that Georgia's banks represents um, approximately 30% of the biomass and 20% and of the fishing area. So some simple math shows that the, the catch rates on Georgia's banks are potentially twice what they are in the rest of the, the, the rest of the, um, the mid-Atlantic. And this Georgia's Banks biomass, this is, this is really virgin biomass. It really hasn't been fished because um, ocean cohogs are a lesser um, uh, valuable clam to the surf clam. Um, they are found from, from North Carolina to Long Island and then out to Georgia's Banks. And there's never really been a reason for vessels to travel all the way out to Georgia's banks when there's plenty of plenty of clams off of Long Island. And what Jessica's previous presentation showed is that now this this area where we're fishing, we're fishing or trying to fish the whole quota on on 66% of the actual bottom, right? That that leads to the that leads to the potential of localized overfishing, which which nobody wants. So getting getting Georgia's banks open for the whole of Georgia's banks open for ocean ocean cohogs is um, is 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 definitely economically important. Next slide, please. So we have a we have a request. We. We'd like the council to we'd like the council to to write the the appropriate people at the at the FDA and it's it's really it's really the FDA that needs to give the advice to the regional administrator so that so that this area can be um, this area can be reopened um, not as an open area but as a controlled access area. Any clams coming out of the, those areas will be, they'll be restricted. There'll be a special tag on them. Everything will have to be, everything will have to be segregated until all the testing um, comes back negative. All the mouse biotoxin testing comes back negative and you get the word, okay, those clams are good for human consumption and, and can, be, can be put out on the market. So this is really not a um, a public health health risk. Um, the 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 NSP guidelines uh, guarantee that, um, and that's that's my presentation for today. I'll take any questions. Yeah, Tom. Thank you very much. Um, as I mentioned before, let's let's take the third, and then I think we can bring all three of you up to the table and and ask any questions. Uh, that council members may have. So next we have Joe Myers. Welcome, yeah. Joe. Yes. Whatever, Th thank whatever. you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members of the council. Uh, my name is Joe Myers, and I am with uh, Sea Watch International. I serve as the Senior Director of Sustainability and uh, Innovation. Uh, so my presentation will sort of dovetail into what Tom and Sam already had, had, had discussed. Um, you can go to the next slide, Jessica. Thank you. Uh, so Tom and Sam talked about the first two aspects of this list here. And, and Jessica's slide earlier, I noted, even included some others with aquaculture and uh, historical sites, marine protected areas, that kind of thing. 
but but what these all have in common is essentially there are areas that give us geographic restrictions on where we can and cannot fish. And in some cases, the rationale for these are very good. Uh, closed areas are inherently not a bad thing, of course. Uh, but if an area is no longer delivering on its intended purpose, uh, it calls for a regulatory revisit, as we're doing with the, the third bullet point there right now, or it's thrust upon the industry with limited or no input, then the result is that we have to fish in other areas. Tom gave you some numbers on, on what that Im impacts with Georgia's. But I'll speak mostly on the, the second two bullet points here on how these effect effectively become uh, areas that restrict us geographically. So how this applies to surf clam ocean copal co-occurrence that we're working on right now is that there's biomass we can access. As we all know, there's a regulatory limit right now that limits the landing of two species on the same vessel. So, so that's the, the, the limit right now. So, but presumably if when we move forward and we find that alternative that gives us that full accountability measure that the council is satisfied with, there's still going to be a limitation and, and that's gonna be an operational limitation because uh, given our current ability to segregate the clams like we need to for our markets, uh, we have a, we do that largely manually right now. So there's still gonna be this limit that, that, that limits us on, on fishing in these areas where, where the two clam beds are mixed. We saw from the SEMPIS funded pursuit crews, if you'll recall some of those charts that looked at the, the um, landing, the, the, the landings at different depths, right in the middle of where the, the cohogs and the surf clams uh, coexist, those uh, cumulative catch rates are, are pretty high. So the clams are there and, and, and we do want to, to fish in areas where we have the most efficient catch, but uh, we're limited right now operationally. But what, we, what action we took uh, as Science Center um, Marine Fisheries members this, fall, this past spring is we funded a project to look at uh, some technology assists that will help us be able to operationally sort clams in, in our plants. So that's, that's the latest update on that. And the eventual outcome hopefully will be for us to be able to harvest in those areas that have the high catch rates, do so in an economically viable manner, and all the while accounting for each of the species to the satisfaction of, of the members here. Uh, the fourth slide there, wind energy areas, uh, they're also a threat to uh, the, us to being able to access the resource in those areas. What's, what's more egregious is that these areas are going to be permanently removed from the biomass calculus. And the reason being is that even uh, uh, the, the, there's a preclusion for a fishing vessel, uh, there's also a preclusion for a survey vessel to go in these areas. And even after any kind of decommissioning of these wind energy areas, uh, there is going to be bottom scour that's almost certainly going to remain in place. So those areas essentially will be uh, uh, restricted to uh, the presence of hydraulic clam dredges uh, in perpetuity, in our opinion. Uh, next slide, Jeff. So that's uh, the, the, the former part I want to talk about is how these all relate to the closed areas and directing our efforts. I'm going to jump over to a little bit more of the science updates uh, that largely come from uh, our work in the Science Center for Marine Fisheries. So even before my direct involvement in this fishery, I recall ocean cohogs were characterized as a resource that we were essentially mining down. And it's clearly now uh, with, with today's uh, perspective a mischaracterization, simply because we have developed techniques to age clams. We know that the, the, we we're able to now, uh, build, we build a dredge to survey submarket clams. And we know that these clams set after the fishery commenced. So I, I point that out just because uh, I will get into a little bit of uh, what's up here. I pulled these phrases out of the um, mixed claim amendment to public scoping document. And in, in, in my perspective, in our, uh, our perspective of Sea Watch, uh, there's some these are mischaracterizations here that possibly need a, a revisit given some of the scientific work that we've uh, amassed since then. So growth rates slowing and low productivity. Uh, we know now that ocean cohogs follow a growth curve that is different than is seen in most fisheries. Uh, uh, Dan Hannon, uh, Eric Powell and such are, are experts on the names of those models. But what we know now is while growth does slow as, uh, as it does for most animals as they age, 
ocean quahogs do continue to grow and will continue to grow uh, after most animals have leveled off in their growth. Ocean quahogs also continue to grow longer than expected. The growth rates seen in recent years are faster at age than animals that set decades ago. And therefore, it's reasonable to assume that we are uh, possibly underestimating productivity of this fishery. Second bullet point dealt with recruitment events. Uh, typically, that's associated with the recruitment, separation of recruitment events by several decades or, de or decadal recruitment. When we age the clams uh, that we've done in uh, many projects, we see there are a greater number of year classes than what would be characterized by uh, decadal spawnings. Uh, they're actually more on the continuous side than they are on the discrete side. And then likewise, we're aging both uh, submarket clams and larger clams, and they go back to uh, sooner years than expected. We're using uh, growth models that uh, the, the animals are younger than expected given size, because we still tend to use these, these older uh, aging models. The third part I'll talk about is uh, some of the references to vulnerability from climate change. So we funded a project in Semphis that looked at what we call antiquated shell. Uh, so researchers found old surf clam shell at a further distance offshore than currently where surf clams live. And then conversely, ocean quahog shell was found that is more inshore than where ocean quahogs are currently caught. This indicates that both species of clams have adapted to past climactic changes and will probably continue to do so. And then another project that Tom referenced, uh, the Atlantic Shores project, uh, that was basically a combination of, of some growth, some economics, the model was called Cephas, that Cephas had funded, and some ocean forecasting models, uh, temperature. And it's going to provide uh, biomass estimates looking forward uh, for, for uh, multi-decades. In some cases, there's more clams. In some places, there's less, less clam biomass projected in some areas, and it's not always a linear uh, descent or ascent uh, in those areas. So there's still threats to, to, from climate change, uh, case in point being ocean acidification, uh, which we also have some work that will be funded on this underway. Uh, but uh, my take home point with this is there's uh, probably a bit more resiliency in these species uh, than what we uh, kind of tend to default to, to our presumptions to. That concludes my comments for today. I want to thank the council for allowing us to recap some of the uh, issues that we brought forward in the FPR. And we continue to stress that the best available science must be used to characterize assessment manage of the fishery. And through that, we'll arrive at the best available outcome. Thank you. OK, thank you for your presentation. Joe, you may want to just stay there. Um, and Tom, if I can call you up, maybe grab a seat at one of the uh, open mics at the end of the table. Offer an opportunity. I'd like to offer an opportunity at this time for any members of the council uh, to ask any questions of our presenters today. Is there anyone here at the table that has any questions for Sam, Tom, or Joe? Sonny Gwen? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll probably know the answer to this question, but um, I'm going to ask it anyway. If your vessels leave the areas you're fishing now, and go to new areas, will that make the area, the, the old areas, reproduce more clams and be more productive? That would depend on a couple of things. Everything else being equal, the answer would be yes, depending, depending on climate change and where the actual habitat is, is moving. Um, we may be leaving areas that won't be reproduced, but the, the, the modeling shows that there are a lot of new areas that are going to become, especially surf clam, are going to become surf clam habitat that haven't been, haven't been surf clam habitat in thousands of years, but, but were once surf clam habitat. And and the, the the fishery has the fishery has historically fished down an area and moved and fished down another area and moved and of course as as we know because of the long lived ocean cohogs it takes a little longer but 
a, a, a positive sign is that we've shown that there is annual reproduction. It's, it's not these huge events that come every 10 years. In the, case of, in the case of surf clams, because they grow to marketable size in five, six, seven years, that will be a, that will be a progression that, that you know, we'll, we'll see in our life, lifetimes. I'm thinking what I'm looking for is if you leave them areas and go to a different area, sooner or later that area that you've left will come back and reproduce. Yes, as, as long as that area hasn't gotten too warm for that to be a decent habitat. Yes, sir. Gotcha. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Is there anyone else on the council that has any questions for our presenters today? Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to everyone, um, Sam online for the presentation. So the modeling work that um, has been done looking at this forecasting of distribution, um, I'll ask you for more details about that offline, but so how far, how, how far north or offshore or where, can you give a general directional sense of where that shift is supposed to occur? Sure. So the, the the modeling that I've seen, and this this is going to be peer reviewed, and Rutgers does have a final report that is um, that is coming out within within the couple months. Um, but the modeling I've seen is is that the wind energy areas up in southern New England, the surf clam habitat is actually going to move that far to the to the north and east in in the relatively 10 12 20 years so yes it's it's going to be it's going to be quite it's going to be quite an expansion and the the loss of the loss of area to the south and the east it showed that those losses are going to be a lot less than what was what was previously imagined because of the, the loss of area in state waters where that, that water is very shallow and warmed quickly. When you get down a little further off the shelf, that those those cold waters seem to stick around even in the face of even in the face of global warming. All right, thank you. Anyone else at the table or online? Member any members of the council have any questions? Joe Semino. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I'm curious. I mean, we've been going through climate scenario planning and talking about the need to adjust our survey work. Uh, are, are the thoughts or discussions on, obviously, this could be financially restrictive, but finding missing recruitment, so to speak, and, and just doing some exploratory survey work? Is there, has, has it gone far enough where there's discussions on, on that actually happening? Well, I'll just add that uh, it, it seems like that uh, when we talk about this in the Science Center, we talk about a re-stratifying survey, and that was done recently. And the, the, the scientists in the Science Center brought up again that another need to re-stratify the survey. So um, I don't know all the need to, to the reason I, rationale behind that, but it seems like things are changing enough that we need to continue to take a look to be sure that we're catching all of these areas where the clams are migrating out of and moving into so that we have as, as good of an accurate representation of what is out there as possible. Another thing, if I might add, a number of a number of years ago, the Science Center of Marine Fishery funded a a selectivity dredge that has bar spacing that is that is much smaller than the than the the, the industry spacing, which is designed to shed everything except the marketable size clams. And and we found, and this is you know this is up to the surveyors, but we found that that dredge is not being used to the to the extent that that it could be. So if it was used more, we would we would definitely get a um, a better sense of better sense of the smaller recruitment in in all of these areas. Jessica. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify when you were talking about the science center and restratification, pushing for restratification of the survey. You're talking about 
the SEMPIS Science Center, not the Northeast Fishery Science Center, which conducts the survey. And just, just to be, be clear, because it's yes. a little confusing when we're just saying Science Center. Jose, did you have anything as well? Yeah, I, I think that it's a good time to 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 uh, clarification on a question that I have. Uh, six, seven years ago, we typically were told by the advisory panel members that the reason the quota was not taken was mainly due to market forces. There was a lot of competition, a lot of imports and things along that line. It seems to be that things are changing now with climate change, some of the closed areas and so on. So my question is, how important is the market demand right now for the products? Is that the, the main driving force for the industry not taking the quota or is it a, a mix of different factors? Is, 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 is market still that important? The market demand that is not allowing you to harvest all the clams? Is that is that the main driving factor? If if I could start off with, and I'll speak only to to ocean cohogs, um, our market forces would like to see more product come across the dock. So we we are not harvesting um, we are not harvesting to our to our full capacity and to what the uh, what the market desires, and that's that's one of the reasons that for the last four or five years we've. We've really been pushing to get to get George's banks opened in in some manner. Uh, yeah, I'll also add that um, yeah, we have markets uh, that would take more product if uh, if we could fish it. And I'll add to it recently that with the opening up of the uh, European Union for the two states that can now accept uh, that where we can now export from the two states from Washington State and from Massachusetts. Um, that opportunity is now open to us. And just recently, all of the federal waters, uh, the federal water designation, designated areas where there have been surf clam and or ocean quahog landings over maybe the past 10 years or so, uh, the, the FDA um, just added those areas uh, to their request for the EU to add that to their traces approved establishment list. So there, there were, when, when that first came out, there were two federal water areas, and now I believe there are about a half dozen, or about a dozen or so of the federal water areas. So that's kind of one of the last pieces, or one of the next pieces that needed to be fulfilled in order for surf clams, notion quahogs landed currently in Massachusetts to be able to be exported to the European Union. All right, thanks, Joe. Sam, I see your hand. Go ahead, Sam. Yeah, I, uh, to answer Jose's question as well, for us specifically, uh, we're allocating every day because we're not catching enough clams, uh, and we certainly could reinvest into our fishery if we were in areas that we could actually have a higher CPUE in because currently um, it's not financially viable. Not It's not going the right direction for us to reinvest into our vessels without access to where the clams actually are. So the market share is, is good now uh, and it's fairly valuable, but we can't access the clams we need to in our area. So the reason we're not catching our tags uh, or our bushels is simply because it's not financially wise to reinvest on the current CPUE that we see in our hand chuck fishery. Thanks. Thank you, Sam. I appreciate that insight. Anyone else from the council? Adam? Sam's uh, part of his presentation raised some concerns about inaction from the New England Fishery Management Council as well as GARFO. I'm wondering if either of those bodies, I know Eric's not here, but it appears to be he's online, would like to weigh in on their viewpoint of reasons for inaction on some of the issues that Sam raised. Yeah, I'm not, I mean, I can, I don't know that I want to put New England on the spot, but if, if Eric is participating and has thoughts, I'll, I'd expect that he would offer those thoughts. Oh, and his hand just went up. Eric Reed. 
Chairman Reed. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Uh, I've got. I'll give you my input. I mean, the, the some of the comments in, in uh, the first presenter's document, I take exception to. Um, you know the the notion that New England was not aware, not properly informed, had lack of input and lack of expertise. In my mind, is totally flawed. Um, and that's not from the lack of trying. And I, I want to point out that at least one member of our council uh, tried to engage the industry, including a couple of trips to the Bristol plant to talk about it. Uh, and that was to no avail. And also for years, uh, you know, we had a we had a clam industry member on our AP, and they were actually the chair during the Habitat Amendment. We've also had uh, Mid Atlantic staff. Uh, on our habitat plan development team uh, during the amendment, we we really coordinated very closely with the clam industry, and it's really not clear to me why these companies weren't aware or involved as we were developing the habitat amendment. That was took a long time, and it was a very public process that they were very involved in our framework. Um, you know, honestly, you can you try to solicit input from certain individuals and companies and you just don't get it. So it, it, it's that's not on the council, that's on industry. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. I might wanna take another bite at that apple, but uh, certainly the, the industry had more than enough representation to, to, to dispute the claims that we weren't aware, weren't informed, or didn't have the expertise during our action. How's that work, Adam? Adam? Well, I mean, I think this is the type of input that I'm looking for. I, I feel like we as the Mid-Atlantic Council have been asked to intervene. We have a role in the management, but I think these competing viewpoints are what we have to ultimately decide on on what our level of action is or isn't going to be. So I, I appreciate the input. Um, I don't know if there's any comment we can get from the service here today regarding the EFP and concerns about authorizing more research. That would be another concern here that would be helpful to have some input on. Mike Penny? Yeah, without going into too much detail, um, we did receive, so as was noted, as a result of the original uh, EFH amendment, H or H the amendment two um, that closed the area, council, the New England Council then um, provided a one-year uh, exemption and initiated a framework adjustment. Part of the discussions around that framework adjustment were uh, sort of terms and conditions, criteria for future research that the council would use to reconsider the areas that had been. Uh, opened in that framework adjustment. So uh, during the development of the framework adjustment, there were a, a lot of areas that the industry had requested be reopened. Uh, the council said we can reopen these three areas uh, if there is additional research that would inform us uh, uh, future decisions. So we worked with the industry and the industry came forward with a proposal for an exempt fishing permit. Uh, the intent was to collect the information that the New England Council had requested that it could use to inform future decision making. Uh, we approved an EFP. Um, it was designed initially as a two phase project. The first phase would then, the results of the first phase would inform the development of the second phase. We approved the first phase. Uh, as the results started to come in, um, we heard some concerns from members of the New England Council, particularly the, the technical, uh, the, the PDT, the information wasn't providing, uh, wasn't basically the, the results weren't providing the information that the council was looking for in order to move forward with a new action. Uh, we've since received a couple of supplement or additional EFP applications, which we have denied uh, for a variety of reasons, including that uh, the, the recommendations and the requests of the New England Council for the information they wanted. Uh, did not appear to be addressed in the EFP applications. So we've been trying to work with the applicants to modify those EFP applications 
so that they would be designed more appropriately to provide the information the New England Council is seeking in order to inform future decision making around reopening those areas. All right, thank you for that, Mike. Adam, was there anything else you wanted some feedback on before we consider? No, I'll just extend a thank you to both Chairman Reed and Mr. Petney here today for providing that information. Uh, I'm sure it's not all what the industry wants to hear, um, you know, but uh, it, it's certainly helpful to try to fully digest, uh, again, what I see as a triangle that we're in the middle of um, and determining how best to proceed. Thank you for that. Okay, thanks, Adam. Michelle Duvall. I'll just echo Adam's thanks and and I will note that I think, you know, last year when we were developing our implementation plan, we did, you know, include in the list of possible additions, I think, uh, a potential action to explore, um, you know, an experimental surf clam fishery in the Great South Channel habitat management area. So it's certainly not, I think, the, the industry's concern and um, priority is certainly not and ignored. I think there's a limit to time and, and resources. And obviously there's, you know, as Mr. Penny indicated, you know, further consideration. So just wanted to point that out. Hey, Michelle, you beat me to it, uh, which was a it's a perfect segue though, um, from your statement and your comment to kind of how I view us taking into consideration the, the pres presentations from today for possible action by the council. As, as you all know, uh, we go through a, a planning exercise each year, which begins in October. Uh, draft implementation plan is put together and then finalized prior to the end of the year at our December council meeting. And um, I believe that for the council to invest the resources, the time, the staff, the the, the energy uh, to consider whether actions are necessary or how to take action or all the different elements that, that go along with um, following through with these requests. It would be during that process that these requests could find themselves surfacing uh, to a point for which the council can take up those actions in, in the upcoming year. So. Um, I wonder, and I'll maybe, you know, Chris and I were kind of sidebarring a little bit, but um, and I'll look over to Peter Hughes, who's our chair of, of the Surf Plan Motion Cohawk Committee, as to whether or not, given the list of elements and given the list of possible actions that could be taking, taken in future council actions, would it be feasible to have a committee meeting uh, perhaps even jointly with the AP to develop those recommend to help develop those draft recommendations for the council's review uh, in October. So I, Chris, maybe you can help me with the timing. That meeting would occur prior to the draft, which then those requests, you know, whatever the council decides becomes high priority, would come to the council as a draft at that point, and then possibly finalized in December. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Peter, before I look to Chris to confirm that he's, we have the time and, and staff for that right now. So I appreciate the question, Mr. Chair, and I'm going to actually look to my left and look, look at Jessica and see what our, our upcoming um, AP and committee meeting schedule looks like. I think we do have something uh, planned for the future but I don't know what that agenda would look like um, so that we could maybe initiate and continue these discussions. Sure, we, um, we don't have anything scheduled, but um, the plan with the species separation requirements amendment was to have you know, the AP and the committee meet prior to us presenting information at the October council meeting. And I think in October is when the draft impl implementation plan comes to the council. So that could work really well, or maybe we can sync up those meetings and take up more than one topic um, at the at the same time um, and and address address those kind of doing a, a full day kind of two topics if that works. Um, but the plan would be to kind of plan to have that feed into the October 
process. Yep. So, I mean, that, that uh, sounds as though it's doable. I'll look to Chris and Chris has anything additional. Yeah, we'll get, we'll get Chris to weigh in here. Chris. Hey, Mr. Chair. So uh, Jessica said that we, as a council, will be considering an implementation plan in October. Uh, not really. It's the executive committee that will be considering an implementation plan in October. So remember the way the process works is that we basically bundle everything up staff we put together a you know memo document we bring it forward to the executive committee we have a good discussion about that and we decide on priorities and we talk about workload and we talk about a number of things and as a result of that you know uh, a meeting and we produce another document that we bring council in december represents what the executive committee basically said at, at their meeting in october one of the things that um, that jessica said relative to our next meeting of the uh, SERP plan committee is that we have a focus on the species separation amendment. So we need to make progress on that. We spent two years, you know, last couple of years dealing with that. You know, we made a decision in December not to proceed with that document, step back, got involved with industry again on that particular amendment. We'd like to make progress on that. At the same time, I think it is a good idea to have the committee consider what industry is bringing to the table today decide whether, in fact, there's anything that we can do relative to including it in our 2014 implementation, our 2024 implementation, that we can then move forward with. So all that sounds good to me. Council agrees. Is there any objection by any members of the council on that path forward? Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll consider that our next steps. Uh, with this, Peter. So relative to um, presentation that was given uh, by Tom, I do have a motion that I'd like to put forward when the time comes. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, and I believe, Jessica, you might have the motion. I pasted the motion in, Steve, and it should be in the document. I'll get to you, James. You can put, you don't have to hold your hand up. I'll get to you in a sec. And all, Monty, I see your hand. And so as soon as we uh, get this motion on the board, I'll go to the audience before we uh, close out this section of the agenda. Mr. Chair, I move that the council request the Food and Drug Administration Vision of Seafood Safety DCEDC Shellfish and Aquaculture Policy Branch, DCEDC1, not sure if that one is a typo or not, advise us, the Council and NIMS Greater Atlantic Regional Office, what specifically is necessary to return the Georgia's Bank PSP closed area to an open controlled access area in accordance with the National shellfish sanitation program guidelines okay so we have a motion uh before us made by peter hughes uh do i have a second for that motion dr duvall you want to speak to the motion peter sure i mean we've heard uh through the presenter that this area has been closed for about 30 years and now it's it's um, it's open um, but it, it's there's a lot of testing that needs to take place while it's open and it's very burdensome uh, to the industry um, we've also heard discussion about how um, foreign markets are starting to open up and starting to um, accept uh, uh, clams harvested in the United States um into the um into the eu um so there's some opportunity there um but there's also some 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 questions and and you know to use i heard somebody say something triangular earlier this is a little bit triangular because with the council we're dealing with the fda and we're dealing with different divisions within the fda and Obviously, there was a slowdown over COVID during this whole period. 
Um, but I think it's time to try to get this back on track so that we can get these areas open um, to, to the fishermen um, who could possibly ex expand um, their utilization of the fishery. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Peter. Michelle, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, I think Peter covered it really well. I um, I saw Jessica's hand go up, and I was just going to ask a question, just noting, you know, in the staff memo that um, you know there was a plan to have a call with NOAA's Office of Seafood Inspection to sort of get an update on some of the stuff. So I was just going to see if Jessica had something to offer, and her hand went up. Go ahead, Jess. Oh, so um, my my comment was not related to that, but um, I do I have been emailing with. Um, Larice uh, Churchill, who's with NOAA Office of Seafood Inspection, she and um, a gentleman over at the FDA have been giving myself and Sustainable Fisheries Division staff updates as we've been tracking this issue. So I plan to have a check in soon. We just haven't been able to connect um, recently. Um, however, my question was um, the in terms of this request. Um, specifically, what kind of request are we talking about? Is this a letter that our council is sending to these divisions to ask um, what would be potentially involved with opening this area, what the timelines are, those kinds of things? Is this an email? Is this, you know, something that um, since the greater, since GARFO is also involved in this motion, is it sufficient for myself and Doug and a few of us to get on, get on the phone or on a webinar and get an update from them. I, I just want to clarify what we mean by request. Yeah, I think we can do that, Peter. What was your Chair, intent? Uh, my apologies. It, it should say that I move that the council send a letter to request. So it was the intent was a letter. Okay, so the we can leave the motion as is, but the intent is a letter to request. Okay, Chris Moore, Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, Jessica, I have a question similar to uh, Michelle's. The uh, we've sent a letter to the FDA before, right? Based on, but not on this particular issue. So, yeah, I'm a little. I'm trying to remember exactly how we how we have, have interacted with them before. And um, yeah, could answer that would be great. We did. We sent a letter um, last fall, I think it was August or September, to the head of the NOAA Seafood Inspection um, Division to their director, and we copied the FDA as well, um, requesting that they prioritize um, that they prioritize this issue that it was important to our clam industry. Um, and we have had discussions again with their staff since and follow ups that they it is a priority. They are working on it. They just met recently the I the interstate shellfish sanitation conference just met re recently in March. Um, so there are some additional um, documents going along with that. But um, they did indicate to us that this is a very um, involved process. It's a national effort so these changes are not just happening in our region they're happening nationally all around the country um, and so those modifications to the model ordinance um, requirements so these changes to the requirements for state and other regulatory authorities there's a lot that goes along with that there's modifications to state and federal regulations that may be involved there's guidance documents other policy documents all of these have to be developed and work in concert um, to ensure that public health isn't threatened um, in, in any way because of you know these bio biotoxins. So we've been getting updates from them regularly um, on what they've been generally working on and what their progress is. Um, but this is some likely they have indicated to us this is likely to be a lengthy process. This is not something that's not going to be wrapped up in the next you know three months. This is this is going to take a couple years for them to work through. Chris Moore, follow up. Thank you, uh, Jessica. So just to be clear, the letter that we sent last fall is on this issue. To pri prioritize this particular issue here that we're talking about. This motion. It, the reason, go ahead. 
it, it was to pri prioritize this issue and specifically mentioned our clam industry and and Deutsche Bank. So <clears throat> I'm asking, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm asking Jessica that, that question because the, this letter would be our second letter on the same topic, right? more or less. Am I, am I thinking about that correctly? It, it would be our second letter on this topic. So just to be effective, you know, we would we would send a letter so everyone understands. I and mean, I'm not speaking for or against the motion. I'm just trying to make it as effective and as efficient as possible. If in fact we submit a letter, we remind them about our letter last year. We did get a response to that letter or no? I don't think we did. I I, I don't think we got a, a written response, um, but we had a follow up with their staff after. So, yeah, so we've had we've had follow up. We didn't get a direct response to the letter. So this letter would be the uh, letter sort of reminding them about the priority of this particular topic for us and asking for something. I mean, what what's detailed here in the motion is still a little unclear, but certainly getting another letter to them isn't going to be difficult for us. I just want to make sure that we're moving down the path to get to some resolution. Tom. Mr. Chairman, if I may, so this this letter here goes directly to to the FDA Division of Seafood Safety, which are going to be the ones that have to recommend to the regional administrator that that these are the steps necessary to take Georgia's banks from the closed status to the managed access status. The the NOAA folks that the letter, the original letter was sent to, they're not the ones that make those decisions. They're not the ones that know specifically. So this, this, this letter is asking for specifics. We've never been given specifics. This has been going on for two and a half years. We've been told things are happening in the background. We're not getting any details on exactly what is happening in the background. Um, this area is very important to the fishery economically, and I believe a follow-up letter is, is, is in order. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other comments on the motion? James Fletcher. This has tremendous implications. It has been discussed. Around 2000, David Day from the New England Council or New England Region and myself tried to develop a rose scallop market in France and Europe. The market exists, but as the clam industry has found out, PSP is a bear that cannot be fought unless everybody is trying to do it and at that time national marine fisheries and fda was not willing to help i hope and pray that the council will do everything it can to help the clam industry open the area because it opens the market for rose scallops thank you thanks james monty rome Online. Monty, if you are speaking, we can't hear you. Oh, sorry about that, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I have some comments about uh, Eric Reed's <clears throat> uh, uh, comments in response to those. Is this the appropriate time or you want to finish this motion? We'll go ahead and finish the motion. I'll come to you before we close the session. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, back to the motion. Peter Hughes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I had edited this motion down for clarity and to make it smaller. It was a much larger motion. But I will say that I did modify one word in there. And it says controlled access area. And I saw in the presentation, and I just heard that it might be controlled access status. Don't know what the difference is. I know that we used access areas as, as you know, a, a term we're all familiar with. 
um, controlled access status might be the more appropriate FDA understood word in there. So uh, maybe a little wordsmithing, just if in parentheses, the status could maybe be inserted into that. I don't know that it changes the, uh, it doesn't change the motion substantially, um, but it may define their definition and how they view an area um, under their definitions versus our definition. That's all. So if, if that's possible, thanks. But we could just put a slash status slash area if Michelle's okay with that. Is there any other ob any objection by the council on that friendly? I'll consider that a friendly amendment. Okay, seeing none. Um, I think it's time to call the question. I haven't heard anyone speaking against the motion, so I'm going to try to do this efficiently. Is there any objection to the motion? By any member of the council, anyone object? Okay, seeing no obje objection, motion carries by consent. Thank you very much, and thank you, Peter, for making the first motion with an acronym that I've seen with a number in it. You know, you know, you're running out, you're running out of space when you have to use numbers. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, um, all right. So we're going to go to one last comment, um, Monty Rome, and then we'll go ahead and close the session. Go ahead, Monty. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, want to comment on Eric Reed's uh, statement about his uh, exceptions to uh, some of the comments made earlier. Uh, I'm a surf clam processor, and I own vessels that harvest on Nantucket Shoals, and I have no recollection from the time that the trailing action went into, uh, got into play uh, of any advising of me or my vessels about any uh, activities going on to close the area. I finally found out about it probably in 2018. Uh, so <clears throat> I don't think that uh, for, for whatever reason, I was not advised as a significant player in the business. Uh, I did attend the meetings in 2018, and uh, the gist of the meetings in, in, in my mind <clears throat> were that this process was going to take place without adequate scientific uh, information and support. So I think that, that it, more than anything, that's what uh, we're referring to about the uh, inexperience or, or maybe <clears throat> whatever way you want to put it, the, the lack of uh, of depth of knowledge of the surf clam industry and the habitat that surf clams uh, reside in uh, was not fully understood. The, the area of Nantucket Shoals is a very intense surf clam habitat. Uh, whether it coexists with codfish, codfish spawning, or other things like that is a fair question because we know that draggermen and scallopers do not fish there. And if they don't fish there, it would make sense to me that there's a uh, there's no fish there for them to catch. So some of the details that Eric brought up that uh, were an exception to what we feel about it, um, I don't think are valid. Uh, I think that scientific work needs to be uh, done. It needs to be uh, guided. If, if, if we're not good at the guessing game of what uh, NOAA wants us to do for science and, and the data, a collection so that we can make good decisions about that, that I believe no one needs to step in and say, look, this is what we need. If you're able to do it, great. If you're not able to do it, let us know. Uh, we don't anticipate NOAA uh, wanting to take on the burden of determining whether or not this is a habitat, which they have described it as, theorized that, uh, that it is. Um, and we don't think they're going to do that, but we are willing to do that. We, I've invested quite a bit of time and money into the process uh, with a uh, multi-beam uh, sonar, uh, size scan sonar system. I was rejected on one of my um, EFP requests. Uh, so, you know, having to do a uh, uh, the NEPA work uh, uh, is, is pretty daunting uh, uh, in order to uh, get a uh, 
an EFP. So there's it, it, it a stumbling block, an obstacle there uh, that makes it very difficult. But we are willing and able to do research. Uh, we have a, an EFP pending, so let's hope that gets uh, approved uh, with any sort of uh, suggestions that NOAA might have uh, to the specifics of what they're looking for, because we don't know them. We don't have good guides. We did have good guides that a multi-beam uh, work would be uh, one of the ways in which to do it. And we we're surprised that we got rejected out of hand on that first application. We're trying again, but uh, I, I think the idea is that uh, we don't believe that there was enough science. It was mostly uh, postulated that this place is a, a good habitat for codfish and, and other types of fin fish, uh, w which is why it uh, fell into this um, uh, this this problem and this closure. So, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thanks, Monty. Yeah. All right, that concludes our business um, under that item on the agenda this morning. Let's take a. 10, 11, 12 minute break. Well, let's come back at 11.05 and we'll pick up with butterfish uh, specifications. Thank you. Hey, Stephen, can you recheck my audio? Yep, you sound good. Thank you.
everyone can start to take their seats. We're going to get started in a minute. Thanks. Okay, welcome back from break. We're going to go ahead next this morning and take up the next item on our agenda, which is a presentation uh, from Jason Didden on the 2024 Butterfish specification. So we have Jason online with us today. Jason, whenever you're ready, go ahead and get started. Thank you. Can you just double confirm audio? Yep, you sound good. Great, thank you. So again, uh, we're reviewing 2024 butterfish specifications. And uh, since there's potentially no action, staff has added a bit of information for background into this presentation um, that isn't necessarily in the briefing materials, but would be online on the council's or center's website. Um, it's going to touch on current management, a little bit of history, both management, fishery, and assessments talk about recent performance in the fishery, then go to our advisory panel and SSC input. So this is one of the early council FMPs back in 1978. It's currently a limited access um, fishery on the directed side of things. Um, there's 274 active permits that are on vessels um, and then another 98 um, that are in CPH or confirmation of permit history. Um, those would be on the shelf, but they're um, kind of moratorium right um, access to the fishery is documented um, in CPH. Um, it used to be a combined um, limited access permit with longfin squid, but was split um, because when um, there was a longfin squid permit requalification um, a number of years ago. So those limited access vessels, they start with no trip limits. However, there is a three inch mesh requirement to possess more than 5,000 pounds. Uh, when the directed fishery was reinitiated, um, that was kind of worked on collaboratively with some of the participants at the time as um, a mesh that they thought they could live with, but should still um, shed some small butterfish. Uh, there is like a step down in that trip limit. It goes down to a thousand pounds uh, to five thousand pounds when there's a thousand metric tons of quota left, um, and then finally a six hundred pound backstop at the quota. That step down is trying to avoid regulatory discards. Um, there's a six hundred pound um, limit for incidental permits for that's an open access fishery. There's also a discard cap for the longfin squid fishery. So these are the 2023 and 2024 butterfish specifications previously recommended by the council. Um, and so the ABC lowers a little bit from 2023 to 2024 um, and the, the, with a stock above its target. If the ABC is taken, the stock should decline slightly towards target. That's the reason for the ABC decline there. So since it's very unlikely that that full ABC would be taken, it adds a bit of um, kind of extra precautionary buffering for 2024 um, in terms of these projections as originally calculated. There's a bit of a management uncertainty buffer. Um, there are deductions for the butterfish uh, cap in the longfin squid fishery deductions for other discards um, that may occur, and then um, the remainder is for landings. So um, a little fishery history, um, the research track had like an industry perspectives uh, working paper 
um, that we reached out to industry to get some kind of historic input. Some things they mentioned were um, the original foreign fishery likely had some substantial underreporting. Um, the domestic fishery was kind of uh, the development of that was led by sea freeze. Um, it's going into a Japanese market primarily. Um, and if you Google JP Lee, a fish that built a port, um, there's a kind of a, 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 he did a neat article on some of that early fishery um, and, and, and what it was like. But the fishery kind of dried up in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, a mix of reasons, some economic issues in Japan, some non-prime butterfish that were shipped that may have soured the market a bit, um, and some decline in abundance and availability. Um, then we had an errant 2004 and retrospectively errant, but uh, at the time over fish determination that kind of locked the fishery down into bycatch only from really about 2005 to 2013. So it dried up kind of on its own, um, but then it got locked down into bycatch only um, when it was in a low productivity state. So again, we had that 04 assessment overfished. We had a 2010 assessment that said, yeah, we don't really know what its status is. And the previous criteria for overfished do not seem applicable. And then in 2012, doctors Miller and Rago kind of came up with an envelope analysis to try to get us out of this stuck box we we're in um, and that allowed a bit of expansion of the quota. Um, then in 2014, we had a new ASAP model also supported by that envelope analysis that said, yeah, it's not overfished and it's never been overfished. That led to substantial increases in quota going into 2015. We had a 2022 research and management track assessments that kind of maintain that not never overfished conclusion. Um, and that 2022 migrated from ASAP to WAM. Predominantly difference there is WAM allows um, kind of process variances in some of the different parameters that um, allows more kind of dynamic considerations versus deterministic assumptions or um, uh, estimates of different parameters that, that, that ASAP limits you to. So this was the stock status output from the last, um, from that research track and management track assessment. Um, so that went up through 2021. See above the target for the time series here. Um, the one kind of new data point for 2022, the Bigelow indices um, that, and I said to 2002 here, but that should be to 2022. So the 2022 data point there, the highest in um, the Bigelow time series. So it was kind of the new data point, that high 2022 data point. So some recent fishery performance. Um, this is a time series of catch landings and discards going into the assessment um, and it's been you know a, mi a real mix of landings and discards for, for for the history of the fishery in terms of the data going into the current assessment a little more recent since 96 we generally have better um, kind of confidence in our landings information since 96 due to some reporting improvements so you can kind of see that nat that natural decline that occurred going in the early 2000s. And that 2001, Sea Freeze stocked a bunch of butterfish, but really had a hard time getting rid of it. Um, they've reported to us in the past. And then that resumption of some directed fishing in more recent years um, as the quota was increased, really starting in 2013. Um, and butterfish prices. Um, and again, this is 2022 dollars, so inflation adjusted. Um, you know, some it's hard to know what to make if there's a long term trend in that or not. Some details on 2022 landings. Um, most of the landings are going into Rhode Island and New York, um, but a mix across some different states. It's mostly bottom otter trawl. Um, and kind of a mix of stat areas that is typical for this fishery. Um, 
there was a working paper in the research track that looked at um, just tried to map the trends in, in, in distributions of kept catch from VTRs and um, observed discards. Uh, so I've got a, a series of, of figures here that jump from the mid 90s to the late teens. Um, and it's going to be kept on the left and discards on the right. And it's broken up by the long fin squid trimesters um, since the discards are kind of tied into to long fin squid fishing to some degree. Um, so we've got, again, starting in mid 90s here, kept on the left, discards to the right, trimester one, January through April. Now we're going to jump to the late 20 teens. And I'm just going to kind of gently go back and forth here. Uh, you can see some differences, but, you know, similar overall range and distribution on uh, a range of kept and discards through trimester one. Now, jumping to long, into long fin squid trimester two, May through August. Again, first we have mid 90s and then going to jump to the late teens. Um, for kept on the left, discard, observe discards on the right. Um, and again, you can kind of see some differences between these time periods, but overall range about the same. And finally, trimester three, September through December, um, again, jumping from mid nineties to more current. Um, and again, you can see some differences um, between these two time periods. And the assessment working paper has it in year blocks going all the way through, um, but I just kind of grabbed mid 90s to current and there's some shifts, but overall range wise, it's fairly similar. So moving on to the AP Fishery Performance Report, main thing with these, we're trying to get insight from advisors from their perspectives as we move into the SSC process um, and monitoring committees and the council. Um, and, and that's really the purpose here. We kind of prime them with a fishery information document, which was some of the information you just saw, um, and some discussion questions to try to get um, discussion going. So highlights from that, which is in the briefing book, uh, they flag for 2021 and 2022. There's a, a, a quite good longfin squid fishery that would have um, you know, kind of focused people's interests on longfin squid versus butterfish. Um, they noted they had good early 2023 fishing for butterfish until the fish started to get a lot of feed in them. As they start to, to go into a, a more active feeding role, that feed is um, in the fish and makes it not as preferred product. Um, in the past, they had flagged that they had some real shipping issues which um, from COVID that were constraining and has become less of an issue. Um, flagging um, ongoing concerns about um, kind of ecosystem concerns. Are we fully accounting for, you know, if there are less herring and mackerel out there? Um, should that be taken into account um, for, for butterfish quotas? Um, an ongoing concern. Um, there's a lot of work done in the last assessment on reference points, but um, the, the kind of as reference points generated in the assessment um, still have not aren't being used. Um, we're back to um, basically setting our fishing mortality as a fraction of natural mortality. It seems to have been working okay, but there's a good bit of uncertainty about that. Um, other things from the fishery performance report, some other management concerns. Um, observing, um, you know, I still have a lot of butterfish discards. Um, including in some in identifiable directed butterfish trips. So kind of what's going on with that. Um, you know, with the projections, assuming fairly high catch occurs in 2023 versus what will actually occur um, and different deductions for discards, management uncertainty, it's concern that um, you know, may uh, management be overly precautionary. Um, and ongoing concern that while the longfin squid fishery has lived within the cap pretty well, um, you know, if we do get in a situation with low butterfish ABCs, um, that you could return to a lot of concern about potentially affecting longfin squid. 
We also asked the um, advisors to touch on research priorities um, and they maintain kind of their same input. Um, wind farm impacts, concerns about the accuracy of a number of things in the assessment, um, the biomass scale, natural mortality, especially since it's used to scale off for our fishing mortality um, and catchability and um, recommendations to keep digging into. There's a lot of work done in the last assessment of where is all this natural mortality that we're assuming occurring? It's been hard to find. Um, and there may be some additional ways to dig into what's eating butterfish. Um, those tie in fairly well to the council's identified research priorities for butterfish. A number of these, um, you know, were directly addressed in the last assessment. For example, it includes um, a kind of um, a compendium of state surveys that go into the assessment model. Um, so a number of these have been um, kind of either um, addressed or resolved or addressed in are still issues, but those um, advisory panel inputs kind of kind of mesh in with these pretty well. I'll, I'll definitely give a, a shout out to Chuck Adams, our lead um, assessment scientist. I mean, I think if I asked him, he could probably tick all of these off off the top of his head. And um, he's quite diligent about trying to um, push the envelope on research priorities, things identified by the council and SSC as he's gearing up for any given assessment and trying to advance the state of butterfish science. Uh, so staff recommendation was to maintain the plan 2024 specifications. Um, again, um, there's a bit of a decrease in ABCs and uh, quotas, landings are DAH, um, but still those would be well above recent. Um, recent fleet performance. Um, the SSC uh, also found that no changes appeared warranted for 2024. They noted the high 2022 um, Bigelow uh, trawl survey results. Um, and I'll turn it back to the council. Thank you again. No action is needed today, um, but happy to entertain um, any questions uh, if there are any. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Appreciate the presentation. Um, as Jason mentioned, there's no action needed today on Butterfish, but I will turn to the council for any questions. Bring up. Seeing nobody at the table. Is there anyone online? Is there anyone here in the audience that has any questions? For Jason. Okay, back to the table. Is there anyone who doesn't want to listen to Jason and would like to take some kind of action? Seeing none, um, I believe that concludes our business under Butterfish. Jason, is there anything else that we need to take up at this time? No, thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much for your. Uh, presentation. Okay, next we're going to move on to a 2024 Atlantic Chub mackerel specs. We have Julia with us from Council, Council staff. Whenever you're ready, Julia. Good morning. Um, Stephen's just going to pull up my presentation, and um, I'll start talking while we wait for that. So the objective of this discussion is to review the 20. 24 specifications that were previously put in place and decide if you think any changes are necessary. Um, and just to jump to the conclusion that staff, AP, SSE, and monitoring committee all recommend no changes. Um, but first, I'll review the management history, recent fishery performance, the AP fishery performance report, the SSE recommendations, and the monitoring committee recommendations. So, um, Stephen, can you skip ahead to slide number three? Um, so just to refresher on the management history for Chub Mackerel, the first management measures were implemented through the unmanaged forage omnibus amendment, and those measures became effective in September of 2017. And they were <clears throat> intended to be temporary management measures that would be replaced as soon as the council could take the time to finish an amendment um, to add Chub Mackerel as a stock in the mackerel squid butterfish FMP, meeting all the requirements 
under the Magnuson Act for a stock in need of conservation and management. So that happened through Amendment 21, which became effective in September of 2020. So now we have all the typical Magnuson Act requirements like ABCs, ACLs, AMs, et cetera. Um, and I won't read through the, the rest of the things on the slide here, but that summarizes, uh, you know, basically the whole management program for Chubb Mackerel. Next slide. Um, so the we have an ABC that's been in place since 2020. And last year, the council reviewed it um, and implemented multi-year specifications to stay in place through 2025. So across that whole time period of 2020 through 2025, it's been the same ABC. Um, it was first recommended by the SSE in July of 2018. Um, and they agreed that this ABC is based on their expert judgment, um, that it's not based on a scientific or quantitative analysis. Um, they agreed that insufficient information exists to assess the status and trends of this stock in the Northwest Atlantic. So this is a very data poor stock. We don't have a stock assessment um, and we don't have any indices of abundance. Um, we haven't gotten recent updates on trawl survey catches, but the information that we had from a few years back shows pretty low and sporadic catches in the trawl survey. So there's a very, very data poor species. So the SSC agreed that the OFL cannot be specified and they recommended an ABC that was based loosely on the historic high for landings and assumptions about discards. And this level of the ABC prevents the fishery from reaching the historic high for landings, but allows higher landings than in all other years. The SSC agreed that this level of the ABC is unlikely to result in overfishing given the general productivity of the species worldwide combined with low fishery capacity in this region. They also agreed that the ABC should apply to the whole East Coast, given what limited information we do know about the stock and its likely distribution and movement and migration patterns. Um, and they reviewed this ABC every year since 2020, and each time they've recommended no changes. Next slide. So then this um, flowchart shows all the other catch and landings limits that derive from the ABC. And I mentioned on the previous slide that the SSC thought the ABC should apply to the whole East Coast. But when the council talked about um, the other management measures, you all agreed that it was not worth implementing other management measures that would apply in the South Atlantic. And this was based on the scale of the fishery in the South Atlantic and um, some input provided by the state of Florida um, about the fishery and basically requesting that the Mid-Atlantic Council not manage the stock down there. So to make that all work, um, the council subtracts a buffer from the ABC for expected South Atlantic catch. And this value has been the same um, ever since 2020. It was based on, um, I, I think, a 20 year time series of data from the South Atlantic, um, picking the highest year and then inflating it by 10% to account for discards, which were not well quantified. So this buffer is meant to be um, a conservatively large buffer. And the data that we've gotten for more recent years shows that the South Atlantic catch hasn't come anywhere close to that buffer. Um, so once that's subtracted, that gets to the ACL. And then the ACL applies just from Maine through North Carolina. And then subtract a 4% management uncertainty buffer from that to get to the annual catch target. Subtract a 6% buffer from that to account for expected dead discards. And you get to the total allowable landings limit of 4.5 million pounds. And uh, the council agreed that um, there shouldn't be any sort of division in terms of commercial and recreational for these catch and landings limits. Um, and so this is commercial and recreational combined is subject to this four and a half million pound TAL. So keep that number in, in mind when looking at the next slide. So four and a half million pounds um, is the TAL. And you can see in this slide that with the exception of one year, landings have not come anywhere near close to that. Um, so commercial landings are shown in teal. And you can see that after remaining below half a million pounds per year for several years, that the commercial landing spiked to 5.25 million pounds in 2013, but they decreased to pre-2013 levels by 2016. Um, in 2022, the commercial landings were only about 18,000 pounds. And then the recreational landings um, are much lower at the scale of this figure, especially in the years with the higher commercial landings. 
um, but they have been increasing since about 2015. And I have another slide later on that zooms into that so you can see it a little better. But the recreational landings in 2022 were about 62,000 pounds. Next slide. Um, so just a little background information on the commercial fishery. So if you um, look at the entire time series of commercial landings, um, most you, you saw that most of the landings occurred in just a few years um, around 2013. And when thinking about the, the vessels that are responsible for most of those landings, um, there's a lot of overlap with the Ilex squid fishery. So it's some of the same vessels fishing in some of the same times of years and some of the same areas as the Ilex fishery. And some of the captains that um, you know are associated with those vessels have provided input in the past saying that chub mackerel has been helpful to them in the past as a bailout species or an alternative to the Ilex fishery in years where there wasn't a lot of Ilex around, but there was chub mackerel. And they worked with some dealers to try to tap into some existing global markets. And that was really helpful for them especially in 2013, which was a poor ILEX year. But in more recent years, um, there's been some stronger ILEX years, so they haven't been focusing on chub mackerel. Um, and almost all of the commercial landings, um, I mean, I, I kind of already said this, but like the bulk of the landings um, over the past 20 years in the commercial fishery are associated with just a few vessels. So fewer than five vessels selling to fewer than three dealers. So depending on how you break down the data, you get into a lot of instances of confidential data. Um, most of the landings, the commercial landings, are coming from bottom otter trawls and lesser amounts from midwater trawls. Most of the landings are coming from June through October. And then the average price per pound um, varies year to year. Um, but on average, it was 51 cents per pound from 2003 through 2002. And that's adjusted to 2022 dollars. There's somewhat of a price and volume relationship where years with higher landings had lower average annual prices per pound and vice versa, but it's not a very uh, linear or consistent relationship, more of like a general trend. Next slide. This figure, I guess the scale of the light blue is kind of hard to see on the uh, screen in the room here, but um, this figure shows where the commercial catch is occurring according to federal VTRs, um, and it's all the data are lumped together across 2003 through 2022. Um, so you can see the darker blue is where most of the landings are occurring. Um, and again, this is driven by just a few vessels that are responsible for most of those landings. But you can see that it's uh, occurring mostly in um, Mid Atlantic Bight area and areas that overlap with the shelf break. Um, sorry that the some of the colors are kind of hard to see, but you should be able to see the presentation online too to get a better idea of what's happening in that figure. Next slide. Um, so we've this year we've been working towards trying to incorporate bycatch information into different stages of the management process. Um, so through the, our NEPA analysis that we do for management actions, we always have some description of bycatch and non-target species, but we haven't always included that um, in these earlier stages, like discussions with the AP and the council. So we're um, trying to provide some of that information earlier on this year. And so this information is um, based on the a very rough analysis that was done for the Amendment 21 environmental assessment. And it hasn't been updated um, since that time. But I think the main conclusions would probably be the same if we were to update it, because I don't know that there would be a ton of additional data points over the most recent few years, given the scale of the commercial fishery. Actually, I think there might be no new data points based on this threshold level that we used to define a chub mackerel trip. So the intent of this analysis was to think about um, on trips where chub mackerel are targeted, what species are also likely to be caught. And so for chub mackerel, this is a little bit challenging because there's not that many trips where chub mackerel are targeted. Um, they're probably more of the bycatch species in the ilex fishery. Um, but if we try to focus on like what could we define as a chub mackerel trip? We decided to look just at trips that landed at least 40,000 pounds of chub mackerel. And this was based on input from people familiar with the fishery during development of Amendment 21, which suggested that if a vessel caught lower amounts of chub mackerel, that they would not be likely to retain them um, because it probably wouldn't be 
uh, profitable, or they might not be able to, you know, find a, a dealer willing to purchase smaller amounts, or it, it just wouldn't make sense economically to land lower amounts. Um, so we use that as the threshold of defining a Chubb mackerel trip. And based on that, over a 20 year time period through 2018, we only uh, found eight observed trips on four vessels that met that threshold. And given that limited amount of data, we decided not to um, do too much of a quantitative analysis and instead just report the other species that were most commonly caught on those trips. And that includes ilex, longfin, butterfish, and round herring. And all other species account for less than 0.5% of total observed catch on those trips. We tried different thresholds to, um, in, instead of 40,000, we tried lower amounts and it still was the same top four species. Um, so this next slide um, is a summary of the recreational fishery information. So starting with the figure here, this shows harvest and catch in numbers of fish from MRIP um, from Maine through North Carolina. And so catch is total catch, including live and dead discards. Um, you can see that landings were pretty low um, until about 2012, and then they kind of jump around for a little bit. And then there's an increasing trend since about 2016. Um, I don't have a good explanation for why there's that divergence in catch and harvest in 2022, where catch went up, but harvest appear to go way down. Um, we didn't get input from advisors to help explain that. Um, maybe it could be um, an MRIP. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what's happening there. Um, but we do see a generally increasing trend in catch, at least over the past several years. Um, so focusing on the most recent five years, um, on average, about 52% of the harvest is from state waters and 48% from federal waters. Most of the harvest is occurring in New York, Rhode Island, and New Jersey. 56% from the private rental mode, 39% party charter, and 5% from shore. Next slide. Um, so the advisors fishery performance report for Chubb Mackerel this year was pretty simple. Um, all the advisors who were present for this meeting agreed that no changes are needed to any of the 2024 specifications. Um, one advisor said that there's low commercial landings in recent years because vessels have been focusing on other species which is mostly elex but also lolligo and this advisor noted that vessels are even less likely to catch chub mackerel when they're targeting lolligo compared to elex and they reviewed the advisors reviewed the research priorities and they didn't think any changes were needed um, one advisor asked about the ongoing efh amendment and if that amendment would provide additional information on chub mackerel um, so staff talked about this a little bit after the ap meeting and the all the smart folks involved in that amendment are planning to do some data limited uh, approaches to looking at the data for a few of our data limited species. So um, maybe we'll get some new and useful information for Chubb Mackerel EFH through that amendment. Um, and the next slide is the SSC report. And I believe Dr. Paul Rago is online and we'll cover this part. Okay, thank you, Julia. Yes. Um, yeah, the chub mackerel is a, is a tough species. There's little data, negligible catches, there's no model and no assessment. So in terms of scientific uh, observations, it's pretty much just commentary. Um, the rec we noted that the recreational catch increases may be due to uh, improved identification by samplers. So there may be a detection effect going on here that's uh, causing some of that increase. Um, but there, there were some concerns expressed um, about uh, from members of the, uh, the the audience about speculation on permits by bait dealers. There are a lot of purchases, but almost no reports. Um, and we did offer some commentary uh, related to the, the differences in the spatial pattern between commercial and recreational fisheries. And these were explained um, by, by sort of the inshore migration patterns that uh, tend to dominate uh, during periods when uh, private anglers can can have access to the to the resource, whereas the commercial, as uh, Julia noted, are um, sort of a bailout species for uh, various offshore fisheries, particularly ilex. Um, so our summary comment was simply that uh, in view of these low catches, the scanty uh, discard information and <clears throat> imprecise uh, recreational catches, 
and really no reliable indicators of relative abundance, we recommend continuation of the ABC at uh, 2300 metric tons for in 2024. It, it was noted, Professor Ed Hood um, uh, noted, uh, you know, that chub mackerel are, are highly productive species and found worldwide. Uh, so again, it, there's some comfort, so to speak, in terms of uh, saying that it, it seems unlikely that there is a, 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 a significant impact associated with the current levels of, of harvesting. So uh, thank you and back to you, Julia. Thanks, next slide. Um, so we scheduled a monitoring committee meeting and then um, it was after the SSC meeting. And by that point we had staff recommendation, AP recommendation and SSC recommendations that were all for no changes. So we, you know, we put this out to the monitoring committee and we said, you know, we don't think there's any new information to suggest that changes are needed and all these different groups think no changes are needed. And if you want to hold a meeting to get together to talk about this, we can, um, but they just agreed over email that they also think no changes are needed. Um, so we, we didn't hold uh, the monitoring committee meeting, but we just had a discussion over email. So um, they, you know, provided further support for no changes for 2024. And then next slide. Um, so the, the discussion point for today is again, um, does the council think that any rev revisions are needed the previously recommended 2024 specifications, and again, staff, AP, SSC, and monitoring committee all think no changes are necessary. And I'm happy to take questions. Thanks. Thanks, Julia, uh, for your presentation. Dr. Rago, thank you for yours as well. Are there any questions for Julia regarding chub mackerel? Adam? Thank you very much. So we spent time here today uh, had all these bodies involved in conversation. AP members take time off the water to do this. Um, as we look at the time challenges that we have with the many pressing matters that come before us, certainly as we look at our um, work plan for a given year, my question is at this point in the five plus years that we've put chub mackerel management in place federally, is there any part of the management measures that have played a role in constraining harvest in this fishery? Julia? Um, I would say no, not that I'm aware of, but um, I think there's people in the audience that have more direct experience in the fishery that might be able to speak to that. Um, I haven't heard um you know from ap members that they felt like any of the management measures um had any like meaningful impact on fishery behavior because it's driven by other factors such as you know targeting focusing on different species so they haven't really been focusing on chub mackerel and i don't know that the you know management measures played a role in any of that on the recreational side of things there's no like bag size or season limits um but also given that the total landings and catch have come nowhere close to the catcher landings limits that it hasn't really felt like there's a need to, you know, to implement any additional management measures for that. So I think just we as a council hearing that information, we should look for ways to continue ideas like what just brought forward, hey, we're gonna cancel a monitoring committee meeting, take stuff up by email, anything we can do to streamline management of this species in particular or any other species as we move forward um, for something that seems to be having no tangible impact on the actual harvest that's occurring on the water is something I think we should be paying attention to to make the best use of our time. Okay, thank you, Adam. I'm gonna take your advice and ask if there's any member of the council that wants to take up any action here and go against the advice of Julia, Dr. Rago, and the monitoring committee. Seeing none at this time, your point's well taken, Adam, and we'll uh, I'll talk with Chris and we'll just try to figure out how to be as effective and efficient as we can uh, in moving forward. So thank you. Julia, thank you very much. Appreciate the presentation. 
Okay, we have one more item on today's agenda, um, this morning's agenda, between us, fresh air and lunch, and that is uh, the highly migratory species update. We have Carol Brewstergeis with us. Carol, welcome. And whenever you're ready to go, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And hello, everybody. It is so good to be here and all and in Virginia Beach, although it's not particularly sunny today. I'm sure it will be a great week for all of you. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Carol Brister Geis. I am in the Highly Migratory Species Management Division of NOAA Fisheries. And I do recognize that I am all that's standing between you and lunch, so I will do my best to go quickly. Um, not sure where I point this. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I am presenting on three very large actions that have a lot of parts. So I'm going to be covering this at a very high level, and I am you are welcome to ask me any questions, and I'll do the best I can to answer them. So these three actions, one of them is a proposed action on Amendment 15, which is regarding spatial management and electronic monitoring for our pelagic longline and bottom longline fisheries. The other two actions are in the scoping phase, so we are very much looking for comments. Uh, these are regarding Amendment 16 to our fishery management plan, which focuses on sharks, and then our electronic reporting action, which is also in scoping. So next slide, please. All right, starting with Amendment 15, which is our proposed action. Next slide. We published this proposed rule and draft environmental impact statement in early May. The comment period ends in mid-September. I have the web page there listed, so you can go there. There is a lot of information on that web page, including a story map which goes through all of the, the spatial management and how we ended up, where we ended up for the proposed measures. Amendment 15 has two very large components to it. One of those is in regard to spatial management and the other regarding electronic monitoring. For spatial management, we currently have four closed areas. The red area off of North Carolina is a shark closed area. It is for bottom longline, and it is closed from January through July 31st of every year. The other areas are all pelagic longline closures. Charleston Bump is in green. That is closed every year from February through April. And the other two areas, DeSoto Canyon, Gulf of Mexico, and East Florida Coast, are closed year-round. These areas were originally closed about 20 years ago. Since that time, except for the bottom longline closure off of North Carolina, we have collected very little data from the areas. Um, this is not a good thing. These are static closures for species that migrate up and down the coast, throughout the Gulf of Mexico, all the time. In the past 20 years, there have been a lot of changes, both in terms of the species. Some of our species are now rebuilt that were overfished at the time. Other species are overfished that we, we didn't realize that at that time. Um, there are changes in the ocean environment. There are changes in how the fishermen fish. So we need to get into those areas and collect the data and determine if these areas are still the appropriate areas for our species. And so that's, that is what started us down the path on Amendment 15. The other component, electronic monitoring, came into play um, when we implemented Amendment 7 to our fishery management plan. Amendment 7 basically redid how we'd look at bluefin tuna and the pelagic longline fishery 
and it implemented individual bluefin quotas and it required that all pelagic longline vessels have on board and use electronic monitoring or videos to confirm their their bluefin tuna this program has been very successful and we have converted a lot of what otherwise would be dead discards of bluefin tuna into landings. So it has helped the pelagic longline fishermen. However, since implementing that in 2015, the agency has implemented a cost allocation policy. And so part of Amendment 15 is looking at coming into compliance with that agency policy. Next slide, please. So I'm going to start with the spatial management portion. Every spatial management preferred alternative has three components. We are looking at potential modifications to the areas. We are looking at data collection programs for those areas. And we are looking at the timing of future evaluations. We do not want to be stuck 20 years from now still not knowing what's happening in these areas. So I'm just going to tell you right now regarding the timing of the evaluation, we are looking at evaluating them every three years, but also if things look a little off or something's just not, not what we expected, we could look at it sooner than the three years. Regarding the Mid-Atlantic Shark area, that is the, the area that is hatched right now, um, we are looking for several modifications and have proposed those. The modifications are in red. We would keep this essentially as a high bycatch area, and you could only go into it if you have an exempted fishing permit, which in this case means our shark research fishery. We would continue to allow that to go into the area. We are also looking at shifting the timing. Right now, this area is closed from January through July, we are looking at shifting it to November through May. So same number of months, just a different time period. And that corresponds with the information we have from the shark research fishery that indicates the sharks are interested in through the areas sooner than they used to, and they leave sooner than they used to. Um, and then lastly, we are modifying the outer edge slightly to more closely align with shelf break, shelf break, excuse me. All right, next slide. The next slide is for the Charleston bump. Um, this has the same timing implications for evaluations. Uh, the hatched area is the area that is currently closed and that is closed February through April. What we are proposing is to split that area into two. The inshore northern area that is in red would be a restricted area. That area you could only go in if you had an exempted fishing permit, and it would be closed year round instead of uh, just February through April. The yellow area from our, our modeling shows that it has a lower bycatch risk. So we would be opening that as a monitoring area. That monitoring area fishermen could go into and fish, but they would have to abide by a number of additional regulations. They would need to have 100% of their sets reviewed through electronic monitoring. They would also have to report uh, select species interactions in real time through their BMS unit. Lim the number of sets we would allow in the Charleston bump is limited to 69, and that would be 69 sets from February through the end of April. We believe that this would allow us to monitor what's happening in that area and determine if there are bycatch issues continuing. And then at the end of those three years, we would evaluate it and see where we go from there. If the bycatch is higher than we expect or something else is going on, we could close that monitoring area and not reopen it until after we do evaluations. Um, moving on, 
I realize the East Florida coast is not necessarily part of what this council looks at, but it is related to the Charleston bump area in that that red area, which is the high bycatch risk area, is connected. So those, those northern and southern boundaries match. So this would create one long closed area year round across the coast. That yellow area in the East Florida coast would, would be a monitoring area similar to the Charleston bump one, only this would be a monitoring area year round and it would be limited to 124 sets. Again, this would allow us to collect the data to be able to evaluate whether or not we need changes to these areas. We are also making, sorry, next slide, proposed changes to the DeSoto Canyon closed area, which I'm not gonna dive into, but happy to answer questions about. Lastly, in our regulations, we are proposing changes that would allow us and set up the criteria for what those evaluations would, would be looking at. And that would be not only for the monitoring areas and these areas, but also for any new management areas that might come up in the future. All right, that's the end of the spatial management portion from the, from the rest of this. I think the presentation will go re relatively quickly. Next slide. So electronic monitoring. Um, as I mentioned, there is a cost allocation policy. Under that policy, we are proposing to transfer 100% of the sampling costs in electronic monitoring to the industry. The agency would continue paying for all the administration of the program, but the sampling costs, the equipment purchase, installation, maintenance, video review would all be paid for by the industry and not by the agency anymore. We are planning on phasing this in over three years. We are also making modifications to when and where electronic monitoring is required. So there are large portions of the ocean where EM would no longer be required year round, though it, all of the ocean would be required at some point in time. Next slide, please. This next slide lays out more of the requirements for the vendors and how they would get approved and what they need to do for the vessels and what they need to do. And then also what the vessels and the vendors need to coordinate on. And mainly that's that vessel monitoring plan, which lays out how the, the cameras would be set up on the vessels and how everything would work. All right, that is the end of the electronic monitoring. It's amendment 15, very broad brush, high level. Moving on to the next slide. I'm now gonna talk about two very large actions. The scoping documents deal with everything for these actions. That doesn't mean in the future that we are gonna be proposing everything that is in here, but we are looking for comments on all of it. So next slide. Amendment 16, Amendment 16 deals with our shark fishery. This stems off of Amendment 14. We just finalized Amendment 14 earlier this year and it establishes a framework to implement acceptable biological catch and annual catch limits in all of our shark fisheries for the recreational and commercial portions. It also changed, um, proposed and finalized a number of operational changes that have not yet gone into place. All of this is being done in Amendment 16, which is why Amendment 16 does so much. Related to Amendment 16, we also recently finalized our shark fishery review or SHARE document. Uh, SHARE looked at everything regarding the shark fishery, what was working, what isn't working. And so a lot of the findings in the SHARE document, you will see echoed throughout Amendment 16. Lastly, just recently in sharks, in the shark world, there were two major changes that happened outside of our division, but are important to keep in mind. Um, one of those is relating to CITES. 
So those of you who may remember the CITES has a number of appendices, appendix one, two, and three. Under appendix two, trade can still happen, but it requires permits. And in the United States, the Fish and Wildlife Service issues those permits. So any fishermen, dealers, scientists wanting to trade in sharks with other countries, um, or if you are bringing sharks in from the high seas, you need an export permit or an import from the sea permit. Um, a number of sharks have been listed under Appendix 2 for a while, such as great smooth scalloped hammerheads, uh, silky sharks, shortfin mako. In the November meeting, they've added bonnethead sharks to the list. So now all hammerhead shark species are listed on CITES. And more importantly, all carcharinids have been listed as Appendix 2. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with, with sharks, carcharinids essentially brings in every single shark species we manage with the exception of smooth dogfish or for all of you, spiny dogfish um, under Appendix 2. So every single shark species will now need a fish and wildlife service import from the sea or export permit before it can be traded overseas. Um, similarly, at the end of the year, the president signed as part of a larger uh, act, the Shark Fin Sales Elimination Act. This act means that it is illegal to trade, sell, keep shark fins that have been removed from the shark carcass. Um, this has direct implications for our fishery. Agency is currently working on a proposed rule regarding this act. There are some exceptions, such as smooth dogfish and spiny dogfish, um, but pretty much every other shark is included in it. What these two external factors mean is that our shark fishery needs to change from a fishery that used the fins and the meat to a fishery that only uses the meat. And Amendment 16 will consider that as we're considering everything else. So moving on to the next slide. We did publish this scoping document in early May. The comment period ends in mid-August. We are planning consistent with Amendment 14 to establish ABCs and ACLs for all non-prohibited shark species, optimize the ability for the commercial and recreational fishery to work, and also increase our management flexibility so we can, can handle other changes in the fishery. Next slide. This means we are looking at literally everything regarding, amendment, uh, regarding the shark fishery. We are looking at establishing ACLs for all of the sharks under the different tiers. We are looking at changing the management group structure. So those of you who are familiar with large coastal, small coastal pelagic sharks, we may be doing, a, doing away with those names um, depending upon how we move forward. Regional and sub-regional splits. This is between the Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico, but there are also splits such as the Atlantic black nose boundary that happens. A lot of black nose are moving farther up north, so we're looking, maybe we don't need the boundary anymore, maybe we need to move it. We're looking at exempted fishing permit quotas for sharks. We're also looking at commercial retention limits and the recreational retention and size limits. So we are looking for comments on pretty much everything regarding sharks. Next slide. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide. I just want to point out this is one example of how following the framework in Amendment 14, things could, could come to be in terms of recreational and commercial quotas. I think the most important thing for this body to recognize is that for when it comes to the recreational sector, we are still considering having that quota in numbers of shark, whereas for the commercial, we are thinking of weight of sharks. So there are a lot more examples within the scoping documents of how quota levels could come to be. Next slide, please. Moving on to the last action that I'm giving you an update on, and this is our electronic reporting advance notice of proposed rulemaking. 
This note is published in early May, as with everything else. Uh, the comment period ends in mid-August. Our purpose is to streamline and modernize our logbook reporting, so moving from paper to electronic. But we're also expanding logbook reporting to for hire and potentially other commercial vessels that do not currently report in logbooks. We are considering collecting additional vessel and dealer information, incentivizing reporting, particularly for the recreational fleets, and then offering an electronic reporting platform for our exempted fishing permit holders. In short, we are looking at reporting for everybody, all of our fishermen, dealers, and the exempted fishing permits. So this is also quite a large rulemaking. Next slide. Um, we are working towards one-stop reporting. So we have been very much involved in all of those meetings. What this would mean is that somebody could report in one place and it would satisfy everybody's reporting needs. Um, so we are involved with, with all of that. We're considering various reporting options for commercial and recreational entities and reporting requirements. Um, that means species and timing. I apologize that the vessel ended up covering up the word that is timing and, and trips. The next slide. So we are requesting public comment on all of those. Next slide. This slide lists off the comment period date along with lists, uh, sorry, the web pages where you can get all of the information and supporting documentation. The number NOAA NIMS 2003 0010, that's called the docket number. And if you put that into the search bar at regulations.gov, you can see all the written comments we've received and also submit written comments of your own. Next slide. We have a number of webinars along with in-person public hearings. We haven't done that since 2020. Um, these are the ones that are coming up in, these, in this area for this council. We have already had a few, and we do have a couple others listed um, or available in the Gulf of Mexico. Next slide. As I said, I covered everything really high level. There's a lot more detail. If you have questions, I'll try to cover them now, but you are also welcome to reach out to any of us listed on this slide. That's it. Thank you. Carol, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. There's a ton of information there, even at a high level. Um, it's job security for quite a number of years, I believe, uh, moving forward. So uh, let me see if anybody from the council has any questions or comments. I'll start with Dewey and then go to Michelle next. Dewey Hemel, right? I think that job security is a key word. It's not job security for the commercial fishermen. This amendment A15 or uh, 15 is a, a inch and seven sixteenths thick document, and in it, um, these areas are closed areas. We have vessel monitoring systems, we have uh, cameras, and they could have put 100% observer coverage, and we could have already had uh, research or looked at in these closed areas but that was not the choice of National Marine Fishery Service, HMS Division. And uh, when you go back to the part of the camera system, they, they forgot and omitted something on there, on that one section with the cameras about how it works. They forgot and omitted the dollar value of up to $289 that could have been or might be placed on an individual to have to pay for that. And I was wondering why they admitted that dollar amount on that particular slide, given that it's in your, in your story history. You know, when you look at what's left, there are 70 active vessels over a three-year period that got IBQ quota. In 1999, when you all closed these areas, there was 432 permits that in 1997, there was 300 and some that were active. And I think in 98, there was over 290 some that were active. So under y'all's leadership in over 23 years, we've watched the decrease of the HMS 
commercial Flagic Long Line down to 70 vessels from Maine to Texas. The recent rollout of A-13 that had 70 vessels that were given IBQ quota that was in active vessels currently have 25 that are in uh, uh, appeals process, which means one third of your fleet is appealing the amendment that you wrote out until to date, five months later, some of us have not seen no uh, quota that's been given to us. You know, I know y'all like to use the word challenges. I use the word epic failures. And when I look at this amendment and the continuation, it makes me want to ask the question, how many boats does HMS want left, given your track record? Thank you. Thanks for your comment, Dewey. I don't know, Carol, um, if you have any thoughts or you want to have a response um, to any of the direct questions from Dewey. Thank you. And, and thank you, Dewey. We are working closely with the appeals office to finalize those appeals, um, as, as you know. I, I don't have anything more to, to add about that. I, I will acknowledge that the number of active vessels has declined the Pelagic Longline fishery over the last 20 years. Our intent with Amendment 15 is not to cause additional declines. Our intent is to try to find ways to open up what used to be very active areas while also being mindful of bycatch concerns that we currently have and that are, are interested in finding solutions for. That is why we are opening up those, those areas for monitoring. Um, in terms of not including the, the costs of the EM, you are correct, we have those costs on the public hearings and webinar presentations when we were doing more of the deep dive. That was one of the one of the tidbits of information that was not included in this presentation in order to keep it high level. So I apologize for that. Okay, thank you, Carol. Michelle Duvall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a, a quick comment. I, I did have the opportunity to go through the story map and I I know there's a ton of information in Amendment 15, so appreciate the efforts to try to make it a little bit more digestible for the public and also, you know, appreciate the effort to try to get some information from these closed areas. I know there have been attempts made in the past and it's been very challenging to, you know, try to get some science to determine whether or not these are the appropriate areas and whether or not they're doing what they're doing. So thank you. Okay, thanks. Anyone else in the room? Jesse, I'll come to you in just a second. Any other member of the council? Okay, I'm going to go to Jesse Hornstein. Jesse? Jesse. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I just wanted to make a comment, and we can uh, submit official comment as well. But specifically, uh, New York is supportive of option L2 in Amendment 16 to the HMS FMP, and that's in the, the recreational section of the scoping document. And this would revise the size and bag limits for all authorized shark species. Um, and the main reason we support this is because we are concerned with the current 54 inch size limit for a common thresher. Um, literature shows that they reach 50% maturity at 85 inches. And the data from the large pelagic survey shows that the majority harvested are below 85 inches. Um, with the prohibition on shortfin mako, uh, we're expecting to see increased effort on common threshers, uh, which could make them more vulnerable to fishing pressure. And while the state could uh, try to make a regulation unilaterally, uh, it's uh, much less difficult for us to enact regulations when we're following actions taken by NOAA. Um, so with that, we, we hope that in the end that no fisheries will set the size limits uh, for these shark species based on, on the size of maturity. Um, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jesse. Okay.
Okay, seeing no other hands, um, I'm going to go out to the audience for any questions. Roger, you can come up to the mic in the center there and just hit the button for the, the little red button will light up. And if you can please just recognize yourself for the comp for the record. Um, my name is Roger Woolahan. I fish out of West Ocean City. I have a directed shark permit. Um, we have a couple, a lot of issues. Um, one, obviously, we're not trusted with the fins. So when we bring the shark in whole, we can't put the we can't we can't put the parts back on our boat to take them out to sea. We can't dump them in the harbor. What do we do with them? We 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 were we actually had to pay a guy in a skiff to take them back out. When I signed up for the shark research program, it's kind of a a mess because I can't put them I can't put shark parts back on a boat that. As a shark permit, both my boats have shark permits, one directed, one indirect. Federal guy showed up and he goes, whoa, 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 you can't put them on your boat. So I ended up putting them in my truck and burying them in the woods. That was when I was signed up for the shark research program, which I lasted three days because I caught the wrong kind of sharks. But I have a bad taste in my mouth for sharks. The other issue is um, the fact that I can catch one shark while I'm croaker fishing in the Northeast region. And I'm looking at it going, wow, do I even want to catch that shark? Because now I have to fill out a whole other form for another region. And it's conflict. Catch one Spanish, and if I'm in the North region, I can't just declare it in the North region. I have to declare something when I come in. So then, so then I have to do two times the paperwork. Another issue I have is that um, the tracking device that you're getting ready to hit us with, both my boats have lobster permits. Well, my shark thing blew up. It cost me 2400 bucks to replace it. Oh, it's on us now. First time the government paid for it. And it cost me $60 a month for that service. So now I'm going to have two lobster tracking devices and a shark tracking device. I'll be over $200 a month in tracking devices. And it just seems like my shark tracking device could work for a lobster tracking device. It would save me that. As it is, I have to have three tracking devices now. So it's three issues I have. And the, the big one is I come in with a shark, say I'm croaker fishing. I can't I have to leave the fins. You don't trust me to sell the fins. I'm not allowed to have the fins because I might cut it off. So I can't throw it back on my boat. I can't throw it in the harbor. What the heck am I supposed to do with it? It's a problem. Yeah. So, and I don't want to put it in my truck. That's what we did the one time when the federal guy was there. And then I lined up a little skiff to take it out to sea. But you don't trust this at all, and it's really pathetic. That's what I got to say. I appreciate the, your your comments, Roger. Yeah. It's three issues. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for your comment. Is there anyone else from the audience? Okay. Seeing no other hands. In the room and seeing no other hands um, online, I'm going to bring it back to the council. I think, in interest of time here, so Hannah Hart, uh, you guys all know Hannah, back in the back of the room over here. Uh, she is our highly migratory species uh, staff lead. So I would suggest if you have an interest in providing comment directly to the HMS uh, division, or you can, um, or you could send comments to Hannah and we can try to synthesize something to, uh, to send it to NOAA Fisheries. So um, I think I'll leave it at that unless anyone else has any suggestions on how to get information uh, regarding this back to Carol. Adam? Was there any consideration from leadership's end of convening the ARHMS committee to discuss directed comments on any of these topics? I, I kind of leaned over and was talking with Chris about it. Um, I don't know. It's something to consider. Um, I don't know how. Far, we're not that far along with this. If you, I don't know if we can go back to the timeline, try to figure out when we might. When is information needed on these actions, Carol? 
for uh, Amendment 16 and electronic reporting. Comment period ends August 18th. Amendment 15, the comment period ends on September 15th. Adam. So I would encourage consideration on leadership side of having that HMS committee meeting between now and the August meeting, bring something potentially back to the August meeting for submission by any of these timelines. Uh, there's, uh, I'm sure if one of our council members has things he'd like to do, and Carol indicated that this was a very high level presentation, maybe that's the place for a deeper dive on this. Uh, you've got members of the public that perhaps would want to uh, participate that would help inform us what direction we should take as a council for submitting comments. Uh, I just uh, I just don't think, Mr. Chairman, it's it's fair to ourselves as a council or to the constituents we represent to just sit here, take a presentation, be provided with opportunity for comment and just say, mm, OK, thank you. I, I think we should be doing more. Okay. Yeah, we can certainly take that under advisement um, to convene the HMS committee. Dewey? Yeah, I'd like to point out that, that this document is, as I said before, inch and seven sixteenths thick. And I started dwelling into it, and I don't know if I can even encompass it all in, in, in my small brain up there. It's taken them two years and probably seven or eight people apiece to, to produce this document. So I don't know how to focus on just the aspect of it because I'm wrapped around the wheels. I don't see the plastic longline industry surviving, uh, continue decreasing as this stuff goes out and the cost that they're asking for. There's a potential here between camera systems, BMS, and having to pay for your uh, somebody to look at your video, if your all your stuff went out and you had to pay for it, it could be close to fifty thousand dollars at one time that you could be hit with something to pay for, or you won't go fishing. So, so I, I don't know how uh, how to wrap my head around all this, given its large document type, uh, uh, to wrap around to give comments on something. And I know my probably. I'm not the one to give the comments, but I'm totally biased against it. And, and so uh, just in my experience with it, I continue to see a decrease. And just my question is asked is how low do we how how many boats you want left? Because when I look at over 20 years, they've done nothing but demise us, taking our livelihoods away and a continued fatheration. And they can't even do their damn job. So uh, it might be a good thing that something that comes out of this, but it's so so much involvement. I don't know who's going to dwell into it to write a comment. Maybe you know, hey, we hope there's a, some few fishermen left when y'all get finished with us, or something like that. Okay, thanks, Dewey. Uh, I have Eric Reed online. Go ahead, Eric. We can't hear you, Eric. You might be on mute. Sorry, Mike. Um, so my, my question is kind of a follow-up to Dewey, and what is the anticipated displacement of effort by these actions into other fisheries? I mean, to Dewey's point, people are not going to be able to afford to be in this fishery anymore. And where are they going to go, and what's that going to look like to our other fisheries in that area and even further north and east. So is there any analysis of that? Carol, do you have any comment on that question? So I don't think we are anticipating that the vessels would not continue fishing in our, our long line fishery. Um, they may displace and fish in other other fisheries like the mahi fishery here, um, but I don't think we are anticipating a large displacement. Okay. 
Thanks for that. Um, so I guess where we are is that I'll talk with Chris and, and Wes and, um, you know, Dewey as chair of HMS, along with Scott as vice chair, maybe that we can have a discussion before we leave this week to see whether or not uh, I think it would be worthy to, to pull a meeting together and get some information for feedback. Uh, as Adam had pointed out, you know, we represent more than ourselves and it might be a good idea to at least provide some general uh, comment um, because this is a very large document with a lot of information in it. And um, it, you know, we'll just take that under consideration. Scott, I saw your hand flash up briefly. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, I just want to um, kind of elaborate on Dewey's comment from before. I, I think a meeting is a great idea because as you started to mention it, as vice chair to the HMS under Dewey, I, I would really appreciate his comments. Um, I think he's probably the the one that knows the most about this. So with a meeting in place where like-minded people, some of which will probably have the same opinion, to keep him calm, I think we could probably uh, come to some agreement on some things and maybe bring something to the council uh, to put forward to HMS. Okay, thanks, Scott. All right, seeing no other hands, let me just check online one last time. I've been Oh, I just lost my connection. All right, so that concludes our business. Thank you, Carol, for your presentation, and um, we'll try to get some comments to you as soon as we can. Thank you very much. So that concludes our business for this morning's session, and we're going to go ahead and break for lunch. It is 12.30. Let's uh, reconvene in an hour at 1.30, um, and I will see you all then. Thank you.